Okay, uh, good morning everyone, or afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is uh, Markus Adas and I'm going to chair uh, today's um, astroparticle physics and cosmology session. We have uh, nine talks uh, in three blocks. The first two blocks will deal uh, with uh, physics of the early universe, primordial uh, black holes, uh, topological defects, scalar fields, and their uh, cosmological implications. And then the uh, third block uh, will switch topic to recent observation of cosmic rays with uh, AS, um, AMS on board the International Space Station. So um, the, uh, every, uh, each talk is uh, limited to 25 minutes, and this includes uh, five minutes for questions. So I would like to ask the speakers to stay within this time limit. Um, what else? Yeah, so uh, um, questions uh, can be asked after uh, the talks. You can use the raise hand uh, function in Zoom to indicate that you want to ask a question and then I can assign uh, speakers. Uh, you can also use the, the chat in Zoom if you, um, if you want to ask a question or if your audio is not working. And there's also a MetaMost uh, channel where you can um, have some follow-up discussion. So I uh, suggest that you use these tools uh, at your convenience. Uh, and uh, if uh, there's going to be a longer discussion on some of the topics, uh, we can break it up. And then there's a, ded a dedicated discussion session at the very end of today's session uh, where we can wrap up. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say. Again, welcome. Uh, attendance is a bit low at the moment, but this is probably due to the uh, inconvenient uh, time slot for the Americas. Let's hope that this is going to increase uh, during the session. And uh, the first speaker today is um, Jens Sun Lin. Can Hello. you start sharing your uh, screen? Sure. Okay, so good evening to everyone. Uh, have you uh, seen my screens? Have you all seen my screens? Yes, you can start. Okay, okay so good evening. Uh, my name is Yan Xun Ying. So I'm a post uh, uh, from the Academic City Khan, Taiwan. So today's talk is based on uh, my, reasons, my recent work with Professor Guilin uh, in the National Jiao Tong University. So uh, all in all, the talk today is about uh, how to uh, uh, how to get the uh, how to constrain the uh, isospin violating dark matter? Uh, sorry, the self intending dark matter with isospin violation features uh, by a very old neutron star. So I will tell you more later. Okay, so uh, I divide my talk today uh, into a few parts. So uh, in part one, I would like to briefly introduce the motivation for introducing uh, dark matter self intention, and although in the later talk, uh, I would like to focus on model independent analysis, but I would like to also uh, present, uh, use a few slides to show you that our model independent analysis is actually justified by a well motivated geometrical uh, models. So and after part one, I would like to change my target to uh, the neutron star capture of dark matter particles. Although such kind of capture mechanism uh, has been uh, studied decades ago, for the solar capture or for the Earth's capture, but for the neutron star capture, there will, uh, there, there will be an additional effect called the polyblocking effect. So I would like to spend some time to discuss with such effect and its, uh, and, uh, its impact to the capture rate com computation. And then follow up. So when the neutron star capture lots of dark matter particles uh, inside it. So these dark matter particles uh, could collapse into a black hole and destroy the entire star. To understand such kind of mechanism is crucial to our later uh, study on the neutron star sensitivity and dark matter parameters. So after all of these uh, four parts, I will address a short summary. Okay, so let's uh, move to the part one. So there are plenty of uh, uh, there are plenty of plenty of evidence uh, that support the existence of dark matter, such as from the galactic rotation curve, from the gravitational lensing effects. 
On the other hand, suppose the documented particles are collisionless. If we put this assumption into the unbody simulation, of course, the results agree with large scale structure observation very well. However, in the small scale structure, uh, typically speaking, the scale or smaller than a few megaparsecs, there are some tensions uh, between the simulation and the observation, such as core Casper problem, uh, missing satellite problem, and too big to fail problem. So in order to resolve this problem, these problems between the simulation and observations, uh, dark matter self-interaction uh, is introduced. So uh, 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 under this assumption that dark matter particles are collisional instead of collisionless, so the energy can be uh, transported between the dark matter particles. So the current astrophysical constraints on the dark matter self in the ankle section sigma chi chi uh, is given, uh, should lie within this range. So this, uh, uh, th this will be a few introduction on the dark matter self interaction. So on the other hand, uh, there are plenty of uh, terrestrial detectors are built to measure the direct interaction between the dark matter and the state and other particles from the sub GV uh, to GV dark matter mass. And these are the current constraint and the dark matter barrel interactions cross section as well as the dark matter electron cross section. Also, other constraints from the supernova, red giant, uh, something like that. Okay, so. Uh, this will be my introduction part uh, on how if I we need dark matter self interaction as well as the current status of dark matter uh, direct detection. So let me move on to the phenomenal setup. So it, uh, our phenomenal setup, uh, we want to include such a feature that dark matter should self interact and also interact with cinema uh, model particles. And we found that there's actually some well motivated model called the W1. Uh, B. So in this model, uh, there are two new gauge bosons I introduced. Uh, one is a scalar boson. You can think that this is uh, just like a ductics. Uh, another, the massive spin one vector boson, just like a duct photon. And in our framework, we assume the, the only dark matter left in the current universe. So it means that there, were, there is no anti dark matter. So in that case, the scalar particle, the, or the scalar boson is responsible for the uh, attractive intact, attractive self interaction. And the vector boson uh, is responsible for the repulsive interaction. But in the later analysis, we will only focus on the attractive in interaction dominant, uh, the, sorry, the attractive interaction dominant range. So we will assume these purple conditions always hold. In that case, we can ignore the repulsive interaction uh, in the dark sector. On the other hand, uh, sorry, in addition, both new gauge boson can also couple to the standard model particle through the kinetic emission as well as the mass mixing. Uh, in that case, we can assign effective Lagrangian for the dark matter baron uh, interaction, such as the uh, dark matter neutral interaction characterized by the epsilon n and dark matter proton interaction. And based on this kind of uh, phenomenal model, it naturally generates the uh, uh, asymmetric interaction strengths between the dark matter neutron and dark matter proton. So we call this effect the isospin violation. So this model also, this phenomenal model also includes the isospin violation effect. It means that dark matter uh, neutron interaction is not necessarily uh, the same as the dark matter proton interactions. They could be the same, but they, in, uh, in general, they. They, this is not a necessary condition. So let's review uh, what we have. So we have uh, dark matter self interaction uh, mediated, by the, mediated by the scalar boson, which is attractive. And we also have dark matter uh, standard model interaction uh, through the uh, new, uh, the, the two gauge bosons and such model also induced the uh, isoscreen violation effect, which the dark matter proton cross section is not necessarily the same as the dark matter neutron cross section sigma chi n here. So this will be the uh, introduction part. So let me move on to the next part, the neutron, uh, the capture mechanism of dark matter by a neutron star. So now imagine uh, there is a neutron star circling around the Milky Way. So it constantly uh, encounters lots of dark matter particles in the halo. So suppose uh, there's one dark matter particle 
one dark matter particle gets attracted by the gravity of the star and falls into it. So let's see what will happen during its passage. So suppose this dark matter particle uh, falls into the star and encounter other barons here. I mean, dark matter can interact with us, can scatter with the barons with the dark matter baron interactions and transport enough energy to the uh, baron after the scattering. So eventually if dark matter lost the significant kinetic energy, then it will be permanently trapped inside the star. So we call this is a neutron star capture of dark matter particle or just a capture for short. So such kind of mechanism that dark matter particles captured by the stellar object, objects has been, have, has been uh, studied a uh, decades ago. Uh, however, in the neutron star case, there's one additional uh, condition that remember that the most of the barons inside the neutron star are indigenous, are in degenerate state. So if the dark matter particles uh, cannot transport enough energy to the barons and excite, excited such barons above the Fermi C, uh, then the scattering will not happen. So when dark matter particle carry the kinetic energy much less than the chemical potential of the stellar components such as neutron baron, there's only a small fraction of barons close to the Fermi C that can participate uh, uh, the scattering process. Uh, this is uh, very different from the, the capture mechanism due to the uh, sun or the earth. So such kind of effect is also called the poly blocking effect and this significantly uh, reduce the capture rate. So in this plot, uh, in this slide, I would like to show you the capture rate uh, of dark matter particles by the neutron star. So this is, uh, let's focus on the left, uh, the left figure here. So the vertical is the uh, capture rate and uh, horizontal is the dark matter mass. So this green line is the capture rate due to the contribution from the neutron capture inside the star. So you can see that the, uh, there's after the, when the dark matter mass is smaller than one GeV, the capture rate uh, is suppressed, uh, become a constant instead of rising up. So this is due to that when dark matter is smaller than one GeV, uh, it's ca the kinetic energy it carries uh, is much less than the chemical potential. So most of the barons uh, do not participate in the scattering. So it is, suffers from a very severe suppression here. And on the other hand, this uh, red line uh, is due to the uh, uh, contribution from, capture contribution from a proton. So the difference is, is uh, due to that the neutron year is much larger than the proton year. So the proton contribution is in general small uh, in the isosphere symmetric case. On the other hand, uh, let's look on the right plot. So this is shows the isosphere violation case that the sigma chi p is much larger than sigma chi n. Uh, under this case, under this uh, scenario, uh, the contribution from proton is much larger than the contribution uh, from, the, from the neutron. So the large, the larger sigma uh, chi p can compensate the small years of neutron. So if I, in the presence of ice spin violation, we cannot simply uh, ignore the, the contribution from a proton to the capture rate. So we know how to capture the dark matter, how to, cap, uh, how to compute the uh, capture rate, then we can compute the total number of dark matter particles n chi uh, being captured inside the star uh, in a given period. Say for example, in this talk, we will always choose the period is five giga years. So this plot shows the total n chi, the total number of dark matter particles inside the star uh, after five giga year. So the blue line is a contribution from neutron and the orange line is a contribution from the proton. So, now we know how to, uh, we know how the dark matter number uh, evolved in the neutron star. So let's, let me move on to the, uh, to the next topic that the black hole formation uh, inside the star due to the uh, capture dark matter particles. So now uh, suppose uh, in the beginning, in the early stage, uh, only a few dark matter particles are captured inside the star. So these dark matter particles uh, will reside uh, in a small region close to the center of the star. And this, the size of the region uh, is uh, determined by the uh, thermal radius. So the thermal radius can be obtained by solving the viral equations. 
So you see that the right hand side is the uh, uh, gravitational potential uh, from the neutron star itself, and the right and the left hand side is the uh, kinetic energy of the dark matter particles. However, when there are more and more dark matter particles being captured inside the star. So eventually the dark matter self-gravity turn uh, cannot be ignored. So if this turn uh, becomes significant, then the thermal radius uh, is no longer valid, uh, uh, is no longer valid for this value here because this time becomes uh, larger and larger. So we have to take the dark matter self-gravity turn into consideration. So when this term becomes larger, then the radius, the thermal radius becomes smaller uh, in order to rebalance this equation. So this means that the region for the dark matter residing in the star becomes smaller and smaller, becomes more and more compressed. So this is called the dark matter self-gravitating effect. So roughly estimated that the self-gravitating will be triggered when the dark matter self-gravity is comparable with uh, uh, the neutron star uh, gravity here. So when the dark matter, when the neutron star capture the dark matter number n chi across this threshold value, the dark matter triggers self-gravitating and the size of this region becomes smaller and smaller. So it undergoes some uh, gravitational contraction. So if there's no any force to, uh, 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 to stop this, uh, to stop this gravitational contraction, then all of the dark matter particles will collapse into a black hole. However, if dark matter is fermion, which is uh, our uh, uh, which is uh, uh, this which is the particles in our uh, work, so when the two fermion gets too close, the Fermi degeneracy pressure will become more and more significant. So such kind of Fermi fermion degeneracy pressure generated from uh, fermion dark matter themselves. Uh, can be a uh, can be a counterbalance to the gravitational contraction. So eventually, the collapse or the gravitational contraction will be stopped by the Fermi pressure generated by the dark matter itself. So in order for the collapse to continue, uh, we found that the, uh, the neutron star must capture enough dark matter particles, which is given uh, by this threshold value. So let me give you some a number that suppose the dark matter particle is one G, then the neutron and put it into and put it into this equation, the neutron star must capture more than 0.1 solar mass in order for the dark matter self-gravity to overcome uh, the, the, the neutron star, uh, sorry, the overcome the Fermi pressure. But this will be very hard because the dark matter baron cross-section is highly constrained by the current direct search. So even I even the neutron star takes the uh, entire age of the universe, it will be very hard for a neutron star to capture such huge amount of dark matter particles inside. However, uh, in the presence of a dark matter self-interaction, particularly speaking for the attractive self-interaction, this self-interaction is an additional help to the gravitational contraction. So with attractive self-interaction, it will significant reduce the number uh, of dark matter particles uh, being captured by, this, uh, by the neutron star to overcome the Fermi pressure. So that's why we exclusively examine the attractive uh, self-interaction case instead of a, a repulsive case. So if dark matter self-interaction is repulsive, then it will be more hard to collapse for dark matter to collapse into a black hole. And this is the real expansion of the Yukawa potential. Uh, I'm not going uh, I'm not going to dive into these mathematical details. I'll simply skip it. So now uh, let's, uh, let's temporarily ignore this complicated stuff in this slide and just focus on the uh, last three conditions here. So now let me summarize in this part for, dark matter, for the capture dark matter particles to collapse into a black hole and consume the entire star. There are three conditions must, three conditions must be met. First, neutron star must capture enough dark matter particles and chi to trigger the dark matter self-gravitating. And when the self-gravitating is triggered, uh, the dark matter number must be uh, large enough to overcome the Fermi pressure. So this counts the dark matter gra self-gravity as well as the attractive, uh, uh, the, 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 the attractive self-interactions. And the third condition is that if the first two conditions are met, then this guarantee, then this guarantee that the dark matter particles will collapse into a black hole. 
but when a black hole was born, there are two competing effects. One is the, one is the accretion rate, the other is a Hawking radiation. If the accretion rate is not larger enough, then the, dark may, then the black hole will evaporate and left no trace of it. So the neutron star still feels fine. So in order for the black hole to grow up after its birth, the initial black hole mass, which translate to the initial, the, the total number of dark matter particle uh, at the moment of collapse should be la also larger than a certain threshold number. So when these three conditions are met, then it guarantees that the, uh, the entire star, neutron star will be, uh, will be destroyed by the dark matter, uh, by the black hole, uh, uh, by the black hole due to the dark matter collapse like this way. So now we uh, have briefly reviewed the capture mechanism and how this capture dark matter particles uh, collapse into a black hole. Let me show you uh, the neutron star sensitivity on dark matter parameter space. So the idea to plot such a sensor, to, to survey such a sensitivity region is quite simple. So there must be a certain fraction of prime uh, of parameters uh, in this uh, of parameters in this uh, uh, in this space that if we put the parameters uh, in this shady region into our framework, the our framework uh, will, tell, uh, will tell us that the neutron star cannot survive longer than five giga year because it already destroyed uh, uh, by the black hole due to dark matter collapse. However, if we search the sky and if we found that the neutron star uh, lives longer enough, much older than this benchmark value, five giga year, then we can further back and constrain, excluding this shadier region, because this, uh, the parameter within this shadier region tells us that the neutron star should be destroyed and we cannot find it. However, if we find any neutron star lives longer enough, then we can constrain back here. So this plot shows the uh, current neutron star sensitivity on dark matter on the dark sector parameters such as the mediator mass and the dark matter mass and the shady region are already excluded uh, for a five giga year old neutron star observation. Different color indicate, uh, indicate a uh, different uh, ice spin violation value. So the blue shade, light blue shady region is a SIDM allowed range, which I show you in the, uh, in the introduction part. On the other hand, not only the dark sector neutron star can also has the sensitivity on the dark matter signal model interaction, such as the sigma kion, the dark matter neutron in uh, cross section. So we can transfer, uh, we can translate it, we can translate back the, uh, by uh, translate this back to the dark matter proton cross section through the ice spin violation value. So in this left plot, I would like to show you the neutron star sensitivity on the dark matter, on the uh, dark matter neutron cross section uh, for a given alpha chi and the dark matter uh, and the scalar, uh, the, the scalar boson mass. So the pink shady region uh, is already excluded and the solid line, dashed line and the dotted line are due to different uh, isospin violation value. So this shady region uh, is excluded by the neutron star observation and the blue shady region is the current uh, result from the Dina one town. On the other hand, if we change the uh, dark sector parameter, the we make the scale boson mo much more heavier, up to 10 MeV. The excluded range will from the neutron star will become larger, and it also the neutron star also cover the range that is uh, that cannot be co that cannot be covered by the current Zina one tau uh, region. So we found that the neutron star also has a sensitivity on um, the dark matter signal interaction. Okay, so this is time limit. Let me summarize. So we found that neutron star acts as a complementary probe to other dark matter detection. In a, the dark matter detection includes dark matter direct detection and dark matter indirect detection. So neutron star is an ideal place, an additional ideal place to probe dark matter parameters. And also we found that in the presence of isospin violation effect, the proton contribution to the capture rate cannot be ignored. And suppose dark matter uh, in self interaction is attractive, then it could become a black hole and destroy the uh, and destroy the very old neutron star. So by observing such old neutron star in the sky, we can constrain the dark matter parameters, no matter if the parameters are in the dark sector only or the parameter that bridges the dark matter and snare model sector. Uh, in this model independent uh, analysis, 
we also provide a justification from a reasonable phenomenological model. So that would be my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Sun. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, again, if you want to ask a question, you can use the raise hand feature or you can also post it in the chat. And I will also check MetaMost. So I can maybe start with one question. Um, so uh, maybe you, you said it at the beginning of the talk and I missed it, but uh, how do you produce dark matter in this scenario? Is this uh, thermally produced in the early universe by the kinetic mixing term? Uh, in general, in our in this work, we did not uh, uh, survey such production of that dark matter in the early universe. We simply assume that uh, dark matter just uh, produced in the early mm -hmm. universe and left it to the present date. And those self interaction and the dark matter cinema interaction are actually described by the dark UR model. So we did, we didn't go through those production mechanism. But I think the production mechanism has been well studied. Uh, uh, in the recent uh, literature with such kind of uh, dark UI model, yeah. And uh, can you maybe go back to your slide 21? So this was one of these uh, space plots. Uh, so uh, slide uh, this one, yeah. Um, okay. Can you say here uh, what generates these um, these features in the blue shaded uh, ah. looks like some resonance features. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, we we took this feature from a, a paper written, uh, I think, uh, uh, written by the professor Yu Hai Po uh, in the maybe 15, 90, uh, maybe twenty fifteen or something. That this feature is due to that if dark matter are. Uh, the intact, the self interaction is attractive. Then, for a true dark matter, gets to uh, slowly gets to uh, slow, slowly, slowly gets uh, closer and closer to each other. They may maybe have some uh, resonance effect for these two uh, dark matter particles to uh, bound together by solving the Schrodinger equation. So this explains the uh, uh, this spike uh, behavior here. Yeah, but for if the dark matter self interaction is much weaker, such as the fine dark fine structure, sorry, the dark fine structure constant is much smaller, or even the dark matter self interaction is repulsive, then this resonance effect, these spikes will disappear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, so yeah, thank you, uh, Hian Sun. Thank and you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you stop sharing your screen, then the next speaker can start sharing. And the next speaker is uh, uh, Takistov. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, if you start sharing. Uh, yes, one second. Um. It, it must be very late for you. Is, is that from Los Angeles or where are you calling in? That's right. It's okay. Um, let's see. Okay. C can you yeah, see the, yeah. the, the full? Oh, okay. Can we also see your red cursor then. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, my name is uh, Vladimir Tachistov uh, from uh, UCLA, and uh, I will. Uh, tell you about primary book called Dark Matter and ways to find it. So let me briefly give some uh, general overview about PBH Dark Matter. So you have black holes that are astrophysical generally, and these come from the old stars. And you also have uh, black holes uh, come from the early universe. And uh, this possibility has been pointed out uh, already more than 50 years ago by Hawking and others. And these are primordial. And now, the question is, uh, why do you care about PBH dark matter? And uh, there are several uh, comments, and uh, you can take them with various grains of salt. There's no clear signs of particle dark matter. And of course, we have very exciting uh, various signatures, but none of them are uh, fully convincing. We are now in the era of gravity wave astronomy, 
of course, with LIGO and uh, so on. Uh, there are uh, also PBH uh, seem to appear quite generically in many BSM models. Uh, of course, this is a model dependent statement. They can help solve some astrophysical puzzles, such as uh, seeds of supermassive black holes. And uh, uh, they actually can already appear in standard cosmology. Of course, this is very unlikely, but in principle, this is already a standard model candidate. So this is a you know, uh, uh, nice point. So what is the state of the PBH? And here is the uh, summary from 2017 from a review by Sasaki and others. And as you can see, depending on uh, the formation, uh, time, and so on, PBH can span very many orders of magnitude. And there's many constraints already throughout the parameter space. So let me now focus uh, briefly on this very uh, important region of order solar mass uh, and a little bit higher for LIGO, which is, of course, very exciting, and point out that there's many constraints there and they depend on many uncertainties and so on. So it is important to study this region further. So let me now uh, tell you briefly about a new robust constraint for LIGO PBH. And this comes from a paper from several weeks ago uh, uh, by myself and uh, uh, other uh, collaborators. And this comes from PBH from gas heating. And the basic idea is that it's very simple is that uh, PBH traversing interstellar medium will interact with gas, right? And this means that the gas will be heated. And there are several generic uh, gas heating mechanisms one is a dynamical friction, and this is uh, on the right hand side is a uh, uh, rough uh, sketch. You have a PBH with an accretion disk, here's gas, and as PBH is passing through, the gas is kind of pulled together. And this is the dynamical friction, and so this is one way to deposit that energy. Then there's also a photon emission, so accretion disk itself is quite hot, so it will emit photons that will also deposit energy into gas. And finally, there's also wind outflows. And what this means is that uh, protons can also come out from the accretion, not just the photons. And they can also deposit heat. Okay. Now, with all these heating mechanisms, a great testing site would be a dark matter-rich uh, uh, dwarf galaxy with a lot of uh, gas and dark matter. And a very good candidate is Leo T, which is very well studied. And then you can ask, basically, will the... Uh, how does how much is the cooling versus heating uh, do you have, and then get a constraint, and this is a robust constraint, and this is independent of any cosmological assumptions. Okay, so that is always nice, and it turns out that the constraint is actually quite powerful, and uh, spans many orders of magnitude, and uh, uh, there are several lines depending on assumptions of accretion, but the point is that in the LIGO region. Uh, we now covered a little bit more of the parameter space, which is always uh, of interest. Okay. So uh, let me mention now uh, what is happening in 2020 beyond just this constraint is that now if you look not just in the LIGO region, but in the top left corner of this plot, all these constraints are actually gone. And they're gone for various reasons. Uh, like, uh, for example, in the femtolensing constraint, uh, people didn't properly take into account uh, the source effects and that uh, when the PBH becomes very small, uh, you need to do uh, diffraction optics and not just regular uh, optics. You, I mean, you need to do wave optics and not just regular optics. And once you take these effects into account, it turns out the constraints are not there, um, okay? So actually right now there is about uh, you know, five orders of magnitude open parameter space window where you can have PBH as all dark matter. And this is of course very exciting. So then next question is how do you form uh, PBH as dark matter? So in a, so to speak, standard PBH formation mechanism, uh, you basically have a big perturbation and it enters the horizon radiation here and then collapses. And here's a little schematic, right? So you have your perturbation, you enter the horizon, and then you collapse. Now, the issue is, is that uh, in uh, these, so to speak, standard constructions, you need to tune your infoton potential. And this can be seen from the fact that in the uh, very simplest models of inflation, the single field inflation, the perturbations are basically scale invariant. So somehow you need to arrange that on a bigger scale, you agree with CMB observations. But then on a small scale, you somehow get a big perturbation uh, from uh, to get the PBH. 
So to do this, you usually need to tune your model significantly, which is, of course, not very really great. And the corollary of this statement is that if you have any restrictions on the behavior of the scalar field, uh, then this will introduce uh, problems of tuning. Okay. And uh, as an example of this, uh, just to illustrate, uh, in a paper with uh, Kawasaki, uh, basically I show that if you, for example, consider the recently proposed uh, string swampland conjectures, which are effectively just restrictions on the uh, potential of the scalar field, it is not so easy to get PBH in a, uh, a very simple model of inflation. But this is just basically an illustration of this point that you need tuning. Okay. Now, let me now mention to you a new general alternative mechanism from scalar fragmentation. Uh, yeah. Now, scalar fields exist, you have the Higgs, uh, and they're very generic in BSM models. And of course, from top-down theories, uh, you expect many scalars also to appear. And in fact, in the typical uh, SUSY-based models, you usually have order 100 scalars, which have very flat potential, so-called flat directions, and they often carry U1 charge, baryon or leptin charge. Now, after inflation, uh, scalars, they have self-interactions, could break apart into pieces, solid tonic pieces due to instabilities. And if you have a complex scalar, it goes to cue balls. If you have a real scalar, it goes to oscillons. It can be either a spectator field or the infoton itself can break into pieces. And here's just a simulation uh, schematic. So you start with a uh, coherent condensate, you run your time, and then you see that uh, you have stabilized lumps. And in fact, if you uh, consider that gravity is the weakest force, and again, this is something that people have been discussing from a more uh, formal perspective, uh, we have shown together with collaborators that uh, fragmentation is even more generic there. So these are comments about scalar fragmentation. But now, what is the relationship with PBH? Well, the fragments are quite big, namely their percent of the horizon at uh, formation, uh, and uh, they're quite stable. And since the process is random, you can imagine that there will be some overdensities in some regions of uh, space. And these overdensities are totally unrelated to what happens uh, with the inflation regenerated big scale of densities. And if some rare regions uh, collapse, then you will get the PBH. And this has been originally suggested for cue balls uh, in uh, uh, this uh, PRL by uh, Alex Kusanko and Eric Kortner. And then uh, I suggested to also do this for Aslans. And then we had a more general analytic description with uh, Sasaki. And here is just a schematic of cosmology. You have your uh, radiation era. Uh, so you, you start with the radiation. After the uh, reheating, the input on the case, you have your radiation. Then there's also these cue balls from some other spectator field. And cue ball scale is matter. So at some later time, they overcome radiation. And some of them collapse to PBH. And actually, a very tiny fraction of them collapse to PBH. The others decay away. And so you're just left with black holes and radiation. OK, so this is a general schematic of cosmology for such a proposal. And then depending on the various uh, parameters that you stick in in your model, you can arrange to get PBH in the interesting region uh, of the dark matter, in the LIGO region, and so on. And what is very another very interesting feature of this scenario is that uh, because this is matter uh, formation, you expect that as these pieces collapse, there is a lot of angular momentum. And so a lot of a big spin is possible for uh, black holes. Well, in typical formation mechanisms, usually black holes that form do not have big spin. So this is a very nice feature, and not many mechanisms can accomplish this. And another thing I would like to point out is that, as you can see, the resulting spectrum is quite peaked for PBH. Okay, So this is PBH from scalar fragmentation. And now let me contrast this with another general formation mechanism from scalars, PBH from bubble multiverse. So what is happening here is that uh, you start with a multi-field inflation. And again, uh, motivated from various top-down constructions, you expect many scalars. So the input on potential is, could be argued that it is expected that it is quite complicated. And uh, if the potential is quite complicated, uh, the, if the shape of the potential is complicated, you expect many minima okay, for the input on potential. Now, 
in that case, uh, as your inflation is happening and you're slowly rolling down, uh, you can uh, encounter nearby minima to where you're rolling in the inflow zone. And then you can tunnel uh, to them and you'll have vacuum bubbles. Now, uh, the bubbles are broadly distributed in size. Uh, when the bubble forms, it expands. And depending on the formation time, uh, there will be different sizes. Okay. Now, some bubbles are, uh, there is some critical regime. And if the bubble overcomes this critical size, in fact, it could support inflation inside it. And so there will be a baby universe inside the bubble. So from the outside, you do not see it. But from the, out, from the inside, some bubbles have very interesting behavior. Now, the bubbles expand during inflation and then later collapse. And so uh, what happens is you will end up, because the bubbles are spread uh, in size, you will have a PBHs with extended mass spectrum. And again, this is compared to the peaked spectrum I showed before. And uh, what I just described is uh, quite well known in the literature and has been studied by many experts, uh, Sasaki, uh, Vilenkin, and so on. And here is an example of a typical spectrum that you expect. So again, there is some critical regime of bubbles where you have this inflation inside in this baby universe. Uh, but the main point is you have this broad distribution. Okay, So you expect a flat shape, and you also then expect this decaying tail. And this is, again, in contrast to the peaked uh, spectrum. So in this uh, work from earlier this year, uh, we uh, had a fresh look again at this uh, bubble multiverse. And here is an example of a uh, two-field potential that we came up with, how this could happen. So you start, this is sort of a tilted Mexican head potential. You start at the top, you roll on the rim, and as you're passing uh, right here, you can tunnel uh, to, the, uh, to the center, then you roll farther, you stop tunneling, and then at the end, you end up in the minimal. Okay, so this is just a schematic potential, how this could happen. And uh, what is more interesting is that if you form PBH dark matter from this mechanism in this open window, you will still have this extended tail because the distribution is expected to be broad. And then you can ask, how can you use this tail to indirectly probe dark matter in the open parameter window? So this provides an indirect test for such models. And in fact, what is very interesting is that HSC uh, uh, from Subaru has detected an event and uh, we uh, fitted that event and showed that you can have uh, PBH uh, dark matter from bubble multiverse compatible with this event. So this is very exciting, of course, uh, and uh, very interesting. But in fact, you can do even better. Uh, in fact, you can generalize the model that I described in such a way that the spectra looks uh, like this. And it's even more extended with additional features. And then you can simultaneously explain dark matter, HSC event, LIGO events, seeds of supermassive black holes together like this. So you have dark matter right here. You have HSC, you have your LIGO, and then later on you have a supermassive black holes. So this is super exciting because you basically have one model for all the observables. And uh, what is more interesting is that uh, HSC, as it will gain more, uh, as it will uh, observe things longer with more nice of observation, we have shown quantitatively that you will basically able to definitively falsify or and test uh, this uh, scenario. Okay, and uh, what, uh, even more uh, good news is that we actually uh, have been awarded additional observation nights uh, for the proposal, so this will be happening. Okay, that's great. So these are two different contrasting models uh, that I have uh, uh, discussed. And again, one has a uh, peaked spectrum. The other one was a more broader spectrum. And so there's different possibilities. Now, uh, but the question is, can you peek a little bit farther into the open dark matter window itself a bit more directly? And here I would like to advocate Compact stars as primordial black hole laboratories, and this has uh, some uh, overlap with the nice uh, previous uh, talk for the particle dark matter. So, in this scenario, you have these small PBHs in this open parameter window, 
and they could be captured by compact stars such as neutron stars or white dwarfs in dark matter rich environments such as the galactic center. Now, uh, once captured, they will grow uh, inside and it will destroy the star. And uh, you can expect some exciting observables. So uh, with uh, Alex Kosenko and George Fuller, uh, we uh, showed that uh, you can explain uh, R process nuclear synthesis, 511 KV uh, galactic center axis, FRBs. And then uh, in uh, some additional follow-ups, uh, I have also discussed that you can get solar mass black holes and some new uh, GRBs. And uh, let me just sketch these things for you uh, now. Uh, and again, I will not go into too much detail, but just give you a flavor of what's happening. So the consider millisecond pulsars, which are basically neutron stars that are rotating very fast. Uh, and they're really rotating near mass shading limit. Now, once you stick in black hole inside, uh, the black hole will consume the star and the star will contract. And by, these, uh, by the angular momentum conservation, it will spin up. And in that case, you can imagine that it's possible that there will be ejective material. Now, I would like to point out that more simulation studies are needed to confirm exactly how this is happening. And depending on what you stick into your simulation, different results come out. So uh, yeah, so more studies are needed. But suppose that is the case, then this is a great site for our process nuclear synthesis. And uh, our process nuclear synthesis is basically uh, one of the dominant uh, ways in astrophysics, how you make heavy elements. Basically, you start with a seed nuclei and if conditions are favorable enough and you're in a neutron rich environment, the neutrons are captured so quickly that you will be able to build up from a seed a high uh, atomic number element. Okay, and on the right hand side, you can see the distribution and the peaks uh, at the higher uh, mass number are the R process peaks and one of them is gold. Okay. So this brings us to the point of making uh, all the heavy elements with uh, PVHs. Now, uh, uh, let me note that uh, the abundance of the heavy elements is such that in the Milky Way, you have 10 to the four solar masses of them. But also if you look in the ultra faint dwarf galaxies, one of the 10 uh, of them, namely reticulum two shows an excess. And it turns out that you can fit both of these things simultaneously assuming uh, the amount of ejecta that we found from an analytical estimates. And uh, now in these estimates, uh, there's very many astrophysical uncertainties that go in, so I would not advocate the right plot as a form of constraint, but rather as a statement that uh, it is interesting that such uh, systems, such laboratories can, in principle, contribute significantly. So what else we can do? Well, we can also explain 511 KV in the galactic center. So uh, as uh, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, and uh, in the galactic center for a long time, you already uh, have been observing uh, an excess in 511 KV and is consistent with uh, E plus annihilation. And the question is, where does this come from? And in fact, from the ejecta, from the expanding ejecta, there will be heating and positrons producing, and you can also fit to this excess. And also explain. So that is also very nice. And in fact, uh, together uh, with the same authors, but also with David Radice, who's an expert in neutron star uh, simulations, we have shown that you can actually explain 511 KV and galactic center excess just with standard neutron star and neutron star mergers without any BSM. Now, as I mentioned, uh, I would like to advocate the view that these are very interesting laboratories for PBH and there's possible exotic signals. And uh, uh, of course, things need to be confirmed with further studies, but let me sketch some of these signals. One of them is orphan kilonova. So kilonova is the afterglow of the ejecta. So for example, usually you have neutron star, neutron star merger, material comes out, and it can, there are uh, nuclear processes that happen. And so you will see an afterglow uh, hours and days after the event. And this is called the kilonova or macronova. Now, in the case of PBH and uh, S, you will also experience the signal. However, the difference is, is that in the case of neutron star merger, you have an, an accompanying merger gravity wave signal because two neutron stars merged. 
But in case of PBHNS, you started as basically neutron star just sitting there, so there is no gravity wave for merger. And so you will have a kilonova without a accompanying gravity wave. So this is a interesting, unique signal to look for. Similarly, you can have a orphan GRB. So for uh, short gamma ray bursts, the standard progenitor is a black hole plus disk. So you have your black hole, you have your accretion disk, the disk is accreted quickly, and the binding energy is then released. And then you have a short GRB. And this is basically what happens in a neutron star, neutron star merger. Now, imagine that uh, if the disk forms from PBH and S system, uh, you could then could also then uh, have uh, such an orphan GRB, but it is orphaned because there is again no accompanying gravity waves. So this would be another type of signal to consider uh, to look for. Further, uh, you also have solar mass uh, black holes that are formed late uh, in cosmological time. And this is probably a more definitive signature of uh, uh, PBH as uh, I'm sure people know that uh, in the astrophysics, you do not expect uh, black holes below 2.5 solar masses. And the reason is this is basically the neutron star stability limit. Now, once you have a neutron star white dwarf and you stick inside the PBH and the PBH eats the thing, you'll end up with a solar mass black hole. Okay. Here's a schematic. Uh, but what is interesting in this particular scenario is that unlike uh, usual uh, uh, scenarios which consider solar mass PBH where the such PBHs are formed from the start, right here you have a uh, population of very small, tiny primordial black holes that make up dark matter in this open window. But then you also have a subpopulation of solar mass black holes that formed late in the, uh, late, uh, at the cosmological times from small PBHs eating the neutron stars. So you have this interesting uh, black hole uh, distribution in your uh, system. All right, so let me then uh, summarize. So this is basically a Renaissance uh, uh, era in PBH research, and mainly because of its synergy with multi-messenger astronomy, such as, the, of course, gravity waves. And there's many new ideas for PBH formation detection, and uh, I outlined uh, several uh, interesting possibilities for formation uh, from scalar field fragmentation. You will get a peaked spectrum, uh, but you also can expect a big spin uh, uh, black holes, which you usually do not get from regular formation mechanism. Uh, in the case, for example, if you do vacuum bubbles, uh, you will have a broad spectrum distribution. Uh, and you can also explain uh, many observables simultaneously, which is very nice. And uh, again, with uh, upcoming HSC observations, we'll be able to test definitively if this scenario will be able to contribute uh, to PBH dark matter in the open window. And further, uh, I try to advocate that compact stars can serve as interesting uh, PBH laboratories for uh, a slew of possible null signatures. Now, of course, there's many open problems. The parameter space is very large and a lot of more work needs to be done. Uh, but of course, the hope is uh, to uh, get definitive statements about the role of uh, primordial black holes uh, in general. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Volodymyr, um, for this nice uh, talk. Uh, it's very uh, many very interesting concepts for the generation of primordial black holes and their test. So we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. And please use your raise hand um, feature on Zoom if you want to ask a question. I can maybe start again with one uh, very early on. I think it was slide uh, six. Uh, you showed this extension of your parameter space in terms of, uh, well, I think it was actually uh, a later one. So you, you basically tried to extend this to lower mass uh, uh, black holes. Uh, I was under the impression that in this uh, low mass region, you um, run into constraints coming from the evaporation of these primordial black holes. Uh, is this taken into account here? Uh, this one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. 
uh, so uh, that's a very good question. So in this, uh, uh, I don't know why in this uh, review they did not show, but you are uh, correct. So the lower bound right here is set exactly by evaporation. So of course, to be dark matter, you want them to be right now, uh, present, uh, present right now. So there's a lower bound right here. Uh, as you correctly pointed out, uh, there are a bunch of additional constraints here, but uh, and uh, even several uh, weeks ago, actually, there was a paper on gas heating, uh, the one I described, but not for the solar mass black holes right here, but actually for the ones right here. Uh, but they are all uh, cut off a little bit of parameter space right here, and there is still a very large uh, space right here. So uh, the answer is that, yes, there is uh, a little bit of parameter space missing right here, but uh, the window is still there. OK, thanks. And uh, yeah, maybe um, from the observational point of view uh, in gravitational waves, uh, can you think about future gravitational wave missions that um, are particularly useful to, to probe these, uh, the background of primordial black holes, I, I guess, uh, there will also be some features in terms of stochastic gravitational wave background that you can observe here. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I haven't uh, thought particularly in detail about stochastic gravity uh, wave background for these particular scenarios. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the answer will depend on the formation uh, mechanism. For example, if you look at the LIGO papers, what they're fitting to PBH depends on a particular formation model. Mm -hmm. uh, right, because you need to say how many binaries there are, how PBH form binaries, but this will depend basically on the cosmology and the, what, what you start with. Uh, so I don't have any particular comments to that, but I do want to say that uh, one definitive feature uh, that I, uh, I briefly mentioned at the end, but also uh, a lot of other people are advocating, are these smaller PBHs. Since you do not expect them in astrophysics, observing a definitively a black hole of one solar mass would constitute to a lot of people a very strong evidence that this is PBH. Now the issue is, is that LIGO by itself in gravity waves as of right now cannot easily distinguish is that a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, so if there's a 1.5 solar mass event it's not clear which one is it. And this uh, the distinction comes in a higher order of tidal deformability effects, which are not too sensitive. So that would be one particular thing mm -hmm. to, if you can see, that would be great. Okay, thank you. So I think we have to move on. Uh, thank, thank you, you uh, Volodymyr. And uh, the next uh, speaker, let me bring up my list here, is um, Anish uh, Goshal. Are you on the call? Yeah. We cannot hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you uh, and you can start sharing your screen. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, so this, uh, the green button on the Zoom. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah. You can yes. start, you see it. Uh, thank you. So I am on, on Anish and I'm going to talk about uh, post in, inflationary reproduction of uh, light dark sex sectors. And this is basically based on this work. Uh, uh, okay, so my, uh, so the out, out, outline of my talk is going, going to be the, uh, some kind of motivations for uh, light dark sectors in particle physics. Then I will they describe the preheating uh, production of this um, in general from in inflationary particle production. And then I'm going to talk about stellar neut neutrinos and cosmological bounds uh, and how these light dark sectors uh, come into play. And uh, then show uh, that how the inflationary particle production and this uh, can be constrained by various uh, of, 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 of observations uh, from uh, late time of, of observation from Al Ali universe in stationary observation. Uh, so this is the standard uh, picture of the thermal history of the universe. We believe it uh, started from a big bang and then it proceeds uh, through the various stages of, uh, and then we it came into the radiation domination universe, uh, dominant universe at the uh, of, of, of orbit. 
from Big Bang nucleus syn uh, synthesis. So, um, uh, so that, that, there are many uh, motivated particle physics scenarios, especially the dark sector, which has got to do with dark matter and neutrino mass. And, um, and a whole uh, dark sector has been uh, postulated in order to account for this. And then um, the, uh, the idea of light dark sector comes in because uh, of the fact that if they are weakly in interacting with the standard model particles and the mediators are, are, are the ones that uh, um, talk to uh, by, by which the standard model particles uh, talk to the dark sector. And um, just um, there are many experiments, uh, lab, laboratory and cosmological to search for these mediators. Uh, we have heard the talks of dark photon beauty for uh, in the idea of the specialization. So, uh, so uh, starting with the concept of in inflation, we know that uh, inflation solves the horizon problem, flatness problem, and fixes the initial fluctuation for galaxy and structure formation in late time of the universe. Uh, you, usually, we, uh, the picture goes like that. Uh, we have a scalar field. It uh, slowly rolls down uh, potential and, uh, and, and then creates this um, expansion, uh, 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 ex expanding part of uh, time uh, in, in the uni uni universe, which we observe at the less than. Um, then the inferton field basically transfers its energy to uh, the visible sex sector. And uh, that's uh, basically called uh, the particle, I mean, post in, in inflationary particle per production. It can proceed perturbative through perturbative process, it can proceed through non, non perturbative process. Right now, in this talk, I'm going to uh, concentrate on non perturbative preheating, which is known as preheating. So basically, it's an oscillation kind of process. As the scalar field in inflation rolls down in an FW background, um, the uh, the equation that it follows is known as the Matthew e equation. And uh, the solution of this uh, scalar, scalar field in terms of this uh, creation and annihilation of uh, operators is given in terms of this in Fourier ex expansion. And, uh, and, this, uh, and these values are this a AQ and Q are, they are just some scaled. Uh, um, scaled uh, very variables uh, in terms of the inflate on Mars and some of the values of the potential, which I'm going to show later. So this equation is pretty hard to solve, and usually it's solved in on lattice. Um, and uh, this is the typical solution of the Matthew equation, where you can see uh, the blue regions of the solution. So the two independent par parameters are AK. And Q, Q are basically represents the various momentum modes, and AQ represents basically the field. And um, these uh, basically are the blue regions of the oscillatory solutions, and uh, and the uh, white regions are the exponentially growing solution. So, uh, in terms of quantum field physics, uh, these oscillations can also be treat treated like um, particle production. And this white regions would essentially mean that um, for, for that kind of potential, for some kind of potential, there might be exponential particle production from the inflationary sector. And this especially happens because uh, the inflation, the inflaton is a bosonic candidate. And if you have other kinds of part particles, which here I just uh, we go into these details of particle physics model later on, if it's a bosonic particle, it will have this particular feature of this exponential uh, particle production. Just an example of the risk. I mean, as the, if, 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 if we have this kind of term, where phi is the inflaton and chi is the particle that the inflaton is getting produced from the inflaton, in then um, this, uh, this uh, rep represents solutions of, of, of the chi. And, um, and you can see that uh, with uh, each growth, the solid solution goes with. Uh, uh, with uh, the different momentum mode. So this, uh, this mixed, mixed uh, quartic term will produce the particles and they, they will grow due to uh, what that is known as both enhancements during the preheating particle production. Okay, uh, so let's keep this slide uh, for the time being. Let's also keep this slide for the time being because I want to come to this later. Let's straight away go to some particle physics motivated scenarios. 
and one of them is a sterile like sterile need neutrino can 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 be there so we know that in um, standard model and also in case i mean neutrinos in general they participate in flavor oscillation uh, it is represented uh, in terms of the rotation matrix which is one of the cnms matrix and if you do the transition probability calculation for the neutrino to oscillate between one flavor and another flavor you usually end up with this uh, combination of this uh, pnms i mean elements of the pnms matrix pnms matrix are basically have some six um, uh, unknown parameters name uh, which are usually constrained from the different oscillation experiments and uh, the six are basically the three mixing angles uh, one delta cp which violates the uh, cp uh, complex phase and then uh, the two mass differences between these two neutrino states uh from the point of view of neutrino experiments we have seen there are a lot of anomalies uh, especially in short baseline uh, experiments some are um, some are uh, from uh, some uh, some are uh, the, from very very with very high significance and then if you do joint analysis with some of the experiments the the significance reduces or goes up uh, for example if if you do uh, mini boon and lsnd it goes to 6.1 sigma an interesting point is uh, and another interesting point of point is that recently in last month also mini boon uh, uh, presented press results where um, actually they this excess has stayed so this excess uh, i mean this uh, and the anomaly has been there for quite long the lsa anomaly has been there for over 15 years now but uh, recently also, also they have observed this uh, mini boon excess with uh, with a very high statistical significance however there are some prob problems and i'm going to show a uh, uh, general sheet in the next slide so although uh, debatable in just the three standard model neutrino plus one standard neutrino framework a light addition strain neutrino with some mixing angle is still fair to so this 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 is the global picture from all non neutrino oscillation experiments this is the um, mixing angle versus the shared neutrino neutrino mass squared this difference you can see the predictions from various experiments and basically the star is the best fit from all experiments so you so already you can see there are some tensions between the different experiments so here uh, for for this talk i'm going to assume that we have a sterile neutrino candidate of uh, a mass at down to 1 ev i mean ev scale mass mass and uh, let's uh, proceed uh, to see the cosmology of this so in uh, cosmology the problem comes in because if you have such a um, ev scale neutrino you it basically con contributes to the effective uh, dark radiation and the two observables that come in from cosmology are basically uh, the total mass of the neutrino as norm normalized with this critical value and then the ineffective which are the essentially the degrees of freedom or the uh, dark radiation and uh, essentially uh, if you change uh, of these values Uh, then it essentially affects bbn it uh, through this, uh, the fact that it changes the hubble expansion so uh, the decoupling and form the formation and decoupling of uh, um, the various uh, nucleons uh, will be affected so you you really have some numbers uh, i mean uh, some constraint on this and it can can cannot be much larger or much smaller than that uh in the cmb something same happens you basically change the matter radiation inequality if you change the n effective uh, and basically it contributes to the uh, predictions of the uh, of the uh, uh, cmb the peaks of of, of, the, of the power of spectrum for large scale structure basically, basically this uh, observable affects because it cuts the neutrino free streaming if you have more massive mini neutrinos or it basically cuts and galaxies would not have been formed there is some constraint on that so instead of uh, so these are basically the two values uh, quoted um, from this might not be the latest but there are some the order when you think so any uh, bsn physics that you do should uh, respect this uh, this part uh, now uh, the fact is that if you have a one easy neutrino then it's uh, read, uh, readily constitutes at one so you you have to be um, save the there are new neutrino physics picture and usually this is done by involving some kind of fixed secret in interaction within the sterile neutrino um uh, spectrum 
And uh, this secret in interaction has been studied by many groups. Some have studied pseudoscalar uh, interaction, some have studied regressor interaction. So what happens is basically you create a um, um, matter-like effect due to this new interaction. And when these neutrinos uh, are produced in early universe through Bordelson withdrawal mechanism or sheet polar mechanism or some kind of oscillation mechanism, this, this extra interaction basically stops due to creating of this matter-like effect and stops the oscillation and sub suppresses the Boltzmann polar production. And typically, uh, there are two key parameters: the coupling strength of the of this interaction versus mass of this mediator. Med 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 and if, if you are within this region of the coupling strain and the mass of this mediator, which here I call it to be chi, uh, you basically can save the uh, um, solution. However, uh, the important aspect uh, here is that you have to consider the dens density, the early, the primordial density of this chi uh, bosons to be almost negligible to avoid this one. Or others, they themselves will contribute to the ineffective degrees of freedom. And uh, this uh, is uh, non-trivial uh, from the sense uh, that uh, I already showed you that if you uh, complete the picture with uh, the inflation and the particle production from inflation, then bosonic mediator would get both enhanced kick and it is uh, very, very um, difficult to keep the primordial in, uh, density of these particles to be um, negative. So what we did we, uh, was we took a very simplified uh, model where we had the phi as the inflation, chi as this particle, and we also have the Higgs. So chi is basically the dark sector, the in inflation gives us inflation, then it decays or, it, I mean, it oscillates to give um, the dark sector, and then the dark sector is formed from the chi, and it also oscillates to give the Higgs sector, and the visible sector is formed from the Higgs. Uh, so now uh, we have this problem. Now let's go back to the slide select. So uh, one thing that we found out that if you have a quartic uh, uh, self interaction among the dark se sector, then uh, these growing modes are essentially stopped. And it basically is because this uh, term acts like the effective mass term during the os oscillation. And uh, it contributes in this manner to the e equation. And this uh, is known as, uh, we call, uh, call it as quartic blocking. So it becomes uh, more and more difficult to produce these quad chi particles if, if you have this uh, lambda chi uh, to be more and more. I mean, if you have more self interaction among the dark sectors, it's very difficult to produce particles. So we wanted to use this. So we wanted to use this uh, property to save the terrain neutrino solution of the early universe from the early universe. Possible. This is just a plot. We solved the Matthew e e e equation on um, lat lattice using this code. And this, this is a plot of the energy density that is shifted uh, to the dark sector. I mean, normalized to with respect to the uh, total energy density of, of the sector. And you, you, you can see, so this is just uh, some time, some time scaled in some manner. And you, you, you can see as time progresses, there is an exponential uh, production. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean, shift of in, energy den density or rather, um, um, transfer of energy density from the inflaton sector to the chi se uh, sector, and uh, sorry, and by by tuning these val val values of um, um, lambda chi, you can see this uh, transfer goes down. So basically, I'm increasing lambda chi values, and the transfer goes down. So now let's go back to what we were discussing. Now, uh, with this property in mind, we chose a typical, very simple potential we can, I mean, one can do with very, very proper, proper uh, UV complete potential. We just took a quartic potential. We have a mixing with the uh, visible sector. We are mixing with the dark sector. And uh, some, okay, and some of the parameters of the potential needed to be fixed from thermalization condition. Some potential needs to, uh, needs to be fixed from CMB observable. Some uh, of these uh, parameters need to be fixed, uh, mean, uh, needed to be, um, uh, need to be uh, set, I mean, uh, to, uh, for, uh, to neglect uh, other kind of in, 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 in interaction. So, uh, we, I mean, also from um, there are iso curvature bounds which we looked into. So, instead of going to the details, let, let me just uh, go straight away go to the result. So, here you can see this is the result that uh, which we were um, trying to see. So, if you have such an inflationary scenario, 
and uh, if if those particles are produced uh, those light bosonic particles are produced then you can see by so this is a plot of n effective versus delta chi the gray region is basically ruled out from cosmology and you can see that uh, for some values for certain values of the parameter mod models by choosing of uh, this lambda chi you can uh, at at very low values for example if the lambda chi would not have been present zero then this is ruled out but by suitably choose choosing lambda chi you can see as i increase there some of the solutions uh, i mean some of these models if, if i call each values to be one model are basically rescued due to this quartic blocking um, so uh, so this was the case for the cell neutrino same, uh, the same same thing can can be done for a dark matter matter case uh, dark matter basically uh, it, it it is like a non thermal production of dark matter Uh, instead of producing the chi's, we call the chi to be the dark matter. But then the other result that that you match in the dark matter sector is not an effective, but the dark matter relic density. So there, uh, you can do this. You can play the same game, and you just uh, match with the relic density. You produce it in the early universe, uh, run through the FR W expansion, and you call it to be the dark matter produced from. Uh, and you also satisfy all the bounds. however there are some prob problems i do not have the time to go into details of the dark matter sex 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 sex, sex, sex. but uh, this, this 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 is i just wanted to point out that this is a, a new uh, production mechanism of uh, non thermal dark matter now let me just conclude uh, so we see that particle production of scalar fields during preheating can be suppressed with a quartic interaction term Uh, sterile neutrino um, solution, which is observed from various neutrino and anomalies, um, can be uh, saved uh, due to presence of these light chi particles. These secret in interactions involving, uh, with the help of chi, blocks this production, cell entry production in our universe, thus saving the cosmology. However, uh, we also need to uh, be in the right parameter space in the inflation model Mem namely we need to have the right for six cell interaction so that the whole early universe cosmology and late universe cosmology makes a viable picture for the non thermal uh, um, the this is just a new production a novel production mechanism from preheating one can consider however there is as usual there is a huge transfer of energy density from the internal sector to the dark sector Uh, in order to satisfy the relic, uh, the uh, quartic blocking or late time inflation decay into the stand in the visible sector uh, has to be taken into account uh, more uh, carefully. And usually, the, um, one needs to in invoke some kind of non-standard evolution like can cannibalism to to make the whole picture. I mean, basically to satisfy the relic density because there is a huge particle production and, and there, there is no way. I mean, instead, I mean, in spite of using the quartic blocking, you need one more I and mean, one uh, more uh, mechanism to satisfy the red 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 relic. And uh, I just want to conclude that this picture will also uh, generate uh, the gravitational waves from the ten tensor uh, part of the um, uh, matter. And uh, this is what uh, we are presently studying. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anish. <clears throat> Anish, <clears throat> are there questions? Please uh, use your raise hand feature on Zoom. Or you can also post the questions in the in the chat or MetaMost. Okay, everyone is satisfied. Maybe let me ask one question. Uh, so, you, so your model is, uh, so, so your focus on electron volt sterile neutrinos motivated by short baseline anomalies. Yes. Is, um, is it feasible to extend this also to other mass ranges? I mean, we also have some, some hints of possible uh, sterile neutrino candidates in the uh, KEV range. From from X-ray data, would this be tunable to different energy mass ranges? Yes, 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 yes. That's that's true. You are correct. So the KV mass range. Sorry, the, we took the e EV mass range precisely because the cosmology is hugely affected. So for for example, if you go beyond emitted cell neutrino, then the cosmology is trivial, right? I mean, because then then cell neutrino does not 
thermalize at 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 at, 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 at all. So from the EV to KV range, as as as, as you are speaking, it's a uh, interesting to study because the cosmology has to be saved uh, by invoking some kind of dark sex sex sector or some other technology, which is the central uh, which plays the central role for this connection between inflation and uh, late time termination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I don't uh, see any other questions. Then um, thank you, Anish, uh, and also uh, the other speakers of this uh, first block. And we will have now uh, a break until, what is it, five minutes to 10, where we are going to reconvene. So see you in a bit.
just a test code. Okay. You can, uh, if you can try. Okay, I will try to share my screen. I see. Okay, thank you. Hello, the test code from my side too. Yeah, Alex, please. You're also the first speaker in the next block. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to the um, astroparticle physics and uh, cosmology uh, session. For those of you who uh, has not uh, have not been in the first session this morning, uh, if you want to ask questions after the talk, please use the raised uh, raise hand option in Zoom, or you can also post questions in the Zoom chat, or you use the 
um, MetaMost discussion channel. And here on uh, the slide, you also see the link here to this uh, chat. So maybe um, Alex, if you can start sharing your screen. Hello. Okay, and I think we can get started. So first, I would like to thank the organizer for, for giving me the possibility to give this talk. So I, want, I will discuss the case of primordial care rotating black holes, uh, which is basically work which has been done in collaboration with uh, Jeremy Ophanger and Josip. Uh, black holes, in fact, uh, are, are now observed. In fact, basically, we have three, three types of black holes which have been discovered. The first kind are stellar black holes, which are well now observed with uh, LIGO, Virgo. The black holes which originated, in fact, in the explosion of supernovae of massive stars with masses, let's say, starting from three solar mass to three solar masses to 100 solar masses. We know also that we have supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies with masses between a million solar masses and 10 to, to the 9, 1 billion or more solar masses. We also know that we have intermediate mass black holes that have been recently discovered with intermediate masses between uh, 1,000 and a million solar masses. Uh, the mechanism for the formation of these black holes are, uh, let's say, probably different. We don't know well how intermediate mass black holes and supermassive black holes are formed. Stellar black holes, in general, are formed from the explosion of stars or may maybe from the merger of neutron stars, etc. Primordial black holes, on the other hand, uh, are not formed from star, star collapse, but they find their origin at the, at the beginning of the universe. They are primordial. They come maybe from inflation or the end of inflation, right after in inflation. So maybe there were very large primordial over densities which collapsed. Maybe there were phase transitions where the black holes were formed or there could have been collapse of cosmic strings of domain walls or other objects, etc. If one assumes that one primordial black hole is formed in one Hubble volume in the early universe, one can show, in fact, that the mass of the primordial black hole, the, of primordial black hole, is related to, to the time, the cosmological time at which they were created. So time zero is the beginning of the friedman lemaitre universe. And one can show so the mass is proportional to this time, and the factor is 10 to the 38 grams. For example, if one take the time as being the Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds, one can find the black hole mass, which is equal, in fact, to the Planck mass, that is 10 to the minus 5 grams. Let's, we can speak of Planck black holes, and we can consider right now that they are the lightest possible black holes. If, on the other hand, one consider black holes of masses 10 to the 15 grams, they were formed at a time of 10 to the minus 23 seconds. In fact, these black holes are the lightest possible black, the lightest black holes which are currently still existing because if the mass of the black hole is smaller than 10 to the 15 grams, uh, the black hole would have vanished much before uh, the, the, the current time. If one consider black holes which could have been formed at the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis at around one second, the mass of such black holes could be as high as 10 to the 5 solar masses, so they could be intermediate mass and black holes, or maybe, in fact, seeds for supermassive black holes. <clears throat> for the, my discussion, I, I want to discuss the case of angular momentum. As for, for neutron stars, black holes can have an angular momentum, which is here uh, called J, just J. And 
One generally defined the dimensionless parameter A star for black holes, which is J over the mass squared. Uh, with this definition, A is between zero and one. Zero is a Schwarzschild black hole that is no rotation, no angular momentum, and one is an ex extremal uh, Kerr black hole, the maximal possible uh, angular momentum. Now, about their formation. For the spin in a standard inflationary model, in general, one considers that there, there is a low spin. And that is, for example, on the left plot from D. D Luca et al. Uh, it is shown that the spin of black holes, A star, is uh, less than 10 to the minus 2 in general. But if you have a transient matter domination uh, uh, in the, in the primordial, uni primordial universe, it can lead to a very high spin. And the right plot, in fact, from uh, Harada et al., uh, you can see that, the, that A star can be as high as 1, depending on the model. So it is possible to have very high spin uh, primordial black holes. Now, what is interesting with primordial black holes is that they are good dark matter candidates. In fact, they are plausible because uh, it's very easy. You need no new extension to the standard model of particle physics. You don't need to extend general relativity. You just work with what you have at hand. Also, black holes are dynamically cold, so it constitutes cold dark matter. We know that they exist somehow, let's say. And there are still mass ranges possible for, for the black holes to represent all of dark matter. I am showing you this plot from Carr and Kunel, which is a very recent, recent plot showing the current constraints on primordial black holes. You have on, on the y-axis the fraction of primordial black holes relative to the dark matter density. One, it means that black holes constitute the whole dark matter as a function of the mass. All the, the colored region correspond to constraints that we have, which are more or less robust, in fact. But basically, the red one corresponds to the evaporation of black holes, meaning Below these limits, the black holes are not uh, have vanished uh, until now. Blue is gravitational lensing, accretion, etc. So we have many constraints, and the A, B, C, and D region are open windows where you can find a large fraction of black holes uh, constituting dark matter. So in the following, I will discuss the A region where we have nearly no constraint and the B region, which correspond to um, planet mass black holes, like Earth, uh, Earth mass black hole, and C correspond to, uh, to stellar black holes. So what is interesting with light black holes is that they emit uh, Hawking radiation. Uh, basically, the black hole horizons can interact with the quantum vacuum if you have, let's say, the, the, the usual picture is if you have a, a pair of particles coming from the fluctuation uh, of the quantum vacuum, uh, one particle of the pair can fall into the black hole and the other one can fight the, the, the gravitational well and leave the black hole and it is, let's say, emitted as Hawking radiation. Then the vacuum will get back its energy. The potential well, gravitational well, in fact, uh, will lose a bit of energy. And so the mass of the black hole will decrease. It is possible uh, to, to compute, in fact, uh, the, the emission of particles by, by a black hole by Hawking radiation. It was first on the calculation of Hawking about that. Here you have um, a formula about, about the rate of emission of standard model particles. And you see that you have a temperature term, E is the energy of one particle. And the idea is, is similar, in fact, to Planck's black, black body radiation though. For a black hole, on one, one speaks about a gray body, not black body because there is some more ab absorption, but you have a temperature. And the temperature is given, the Hawking temperature is given by this formula. For a Schwarzschild non-rotating black hole, the formula is very easy. It's uh, the inverse of the mass with uh, the factor eight pi. The temperature is, in, is an important parameter. 
because if you have a very high temperature, you could emit particles with very high masses. And the temperature is influenced, in fact, by the rotation of the black hole. So for example, here you have the temperature as a function of the mass. So you have light black holes about 10 to the 15 GV. Uh, in blue, you have uh, Schwarzschild, a non-rotating black hole. And in red, you have a nearly extrema extremal uh, care black hole. So you see that the temperature is shifted down when, uh, because, in fact, of the angular momentum. And if you would like to emit, for example, uh, positrons and electrons, you, you see that if you have a, a massive 10 to the 16 gram uh, extremal care black holes, it will not emit electrons and positrons, but a Schwarzschild black hole would be able to emit them. So uh, the emission of particles strongly depends, in fact, on the angular momentum. Also, there is an additional effect. Uh, there is what is called the super radiance effect, which is a kind of coupling between the black hole spin and the particle spin. And in fact, it was shown that Hawking radiation is enhanced for particle of spin one and two. So here you have the emission of photons, spin one particles, as a function of the energy E of the particle. For a Schwarzschild black hole, you have the blue line. And for uh, a care black hole, you can have either the red if it's nearly extremal or a green one in an intermediate solution. So there is a strong enhancement by orders of magnitude on the, on the emission of, uh, of particles. Because particles are emitted, energy is lost, the mass of the black hole decreases, and one can speak about the vanishing of a black hole. With uh, well, you can see on the left the lifetime of the black hole that you obtain by integrating over the emission of, of particles. So you have the lifetime of the black hole as a function of the mass of the black hole. Uh, you see here that you have the age of the universe, which means if a black hole has a, uh, has a mass which is larger than 10 to the 15 uh, gram, uh, it, it, it has a lifetime which is, let's say, uh, about the age of the universe. You don't see with, with such uh, uh, a plot really the difference between Kerr and Schwarzschild black holes, but on the right, you can see more the difference. Here in solid line, we show the evolution of the mass of the black hole as a function of the time. Uh, well, on the left, you have the mass over the initial mass. You see that for uh, Schwarzschild black hole, the mass decreases uh, slowly. Then, in fact, the mass at the end decreases very fast. Uh, you can say at the end you have a kind of bomb. <coughs> it, it, uh, it, it, uh, yes, it vanishes very fast. For, for Kerr black holes, you have the, the green and red lines. So the, the vanishing is faster by a factor of two, let's say. For the spin, the evolution of the spin is given in dotted line. So the spin is zero for a Schwarzschild black hole. So it starts at zero and stays at zero. And in fact, the spin decreases slowly, um, uh, fast, and goes to zero and then stays to zero. And um, so uh, the more the spin of the black hole is important, the faster the loss of the spin exists. So the question is, is it possible to have an extremal spin today after, in fact, 13 billion years? There exists a, a limit uh, given by four about the spin of rotating black holes from disk accretion, from, from let's say, solar, uh, stellar uh, black holes. This limit is 0 0.998. It's difficult for a black hole to have uh, a star larger than this value from only uh, disk accretion. But primordial black holes could have been created with uh, a spin, uh, an a star, a star which is very close to one. So you have the value of one minus a star today as a function of the mass of the black hole for different starting value very close to one. Uh, you see, in fact, that the larger, uh, the, uh, the, the heavier the black hole is, and uh, the higher 
is the final value of A star. Basically, if you have a black hole with a mass larger than 10 to the uh, 17 grams, they will keep, in fact, their, their very high um, angular momentum. So it's possible to have extremal spin today, well below, in fact, uh, for me. Uh, I will consider now the isotropic gamma ray background constraint. So the gamma ray by background constraint from, comes from diffuse background, for example, uh, and in addition, act active uh, galactic nuclei, gamma ray bursts, maybe dark matter annihilation, Hawking radiation. It has been well measured by um, different experiments. You have here the flux of energy of the gamma uh, ray background as a function of the energy of the particle. So black hole can participate, in fact, to this uh, IGRB. You have to integrate over the emission of radiation from cosmic micro background until today, uh, using uh, considering also the redshift, uh, redshift for that. And you can obtain constraints from that. So uh, when you have a care black hole, the spin has two effects. It can enhance the luminosity uh, because there is more emission of radiation, so stronger constraint, but at the same time, the temperature is reduced in care black holes, so there is less uh, emission of energies and you, you get weaker constraints. So you have both effects which can compensate or not. Here, I show you the fraction of, um, of uh, PBH over the dark matter density as a function of the mass. So we are in the window a that we had at the beginning. If we consider that all black holes have the same mass, you can obtain this plot. So in green, you have the constraint, the excluded region when you have no spin. And in, uh, in uh, light blue, let's say, you have what you get when you have a care black hole. So the constraints are stronger when you have care black holes and the region is more excluded. Now, there is another effect. When gen in general, one considers that all black, uh, primordial black holes have the same mass, but it is probably not the case. We studied, in fact, on the width effect. So we consider the normal, uh, log normal distribution with a width sigma. <clears throat> so because of the width, you broaden, in fact, the emission spectrum, which leads to stronger constraints. And at the same time, you, you uh, broaden the mass distribution, which leads to a larger dark matter total density, which weaken the constraints. So the, the upper left plot is monochromatic, and you then increase, in fact, uh, sigma. And you see that the constraints are very different when you, you use, in fact, uh, a large width equal to 1, in fact. It goes up to 10 to the 18 grams um, uh, with, uh, with such uh, a large uh, distribution. Uh, an important effect also is the fact that black holes can emit gravitons. They can emit all kinds of particles. So here you have the emission rate for spin 0, spin 1, 1 half, and spin 2 particles. So, so spin 2 is graviton. So, uh, primordial black holes can emit gravitons and therefore gravitational waves. Now we, we study the emission of gravi gravitational waves by primordial black holes. You have on the left plot the frequency of emission as a function of the mass. Uh, you have the sensitivity of LIGO, Virgo, and the future LISA and BBO uh, experiments. <clears throat> you see that they are sensitive, in fact, to the frequency, uh, which are very close to 10 to the 40 uh, solar masses. So uh, very, very massive uh, black holes, supermassive black holes, in fact. So supermassive black holes emit at frequencies of, of the, the, the experiment that we have on Earth, or will have on Earth. Unfortunately, the flux is decreasing a lot when you increase the mass of the black hole. And when you have supermassive black hole, the flux of Hawking radiation is extremely low, and you have no chance to see this with, uh, with the current sensitivities and probably in the future too. But we can consider that gravitational waves can bring, in fact, information from the very early universe. In fact, 
very light primordial black holes, which have now vanished. So with masses well below in that five, in, in fact, uh, the 10 to the 15 gram. That, so they don't exist anymore, but they could have left imprints in the cosmological background of gravitational waves. So here, it's a, a preliminary plot about the density of gravitational waves as a function of the frequency for different masses of the black hole, uh, starting at the Planck mass uh, down, uh, up to, to a mass of 10 to the 9 gram. So at Planck mass, we are before inflation. Uh, at uh, 10 to the 9 gram, we are uh, more massive uh, black holes, which vanished well before, in fact, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So you can see that uh, for such 10 to the 9 gram black holes, you can have a very high density of pr primordial uh, gravitational waves emitted, which is of the order of uh, LISA and BBO sensitivity, but with, uh, uh, sorry, with a frequency which is much, much higher. In any case, uh, trying to discover uh, Hawking radiation is important for, the, for gravitational waves because if you discover gravitational waves emitted by Hawking radiation, you validate at the same time the existence of the graviton. Now, uh, something, let's say, amusing, I would say, uh, there, there have been uh, studies which have so, shown that uh, transneptunian objects, TNOs, that have anomalous orbits, and there is an excess in microlensing events in the solar system at a distance of, let's say, uh, between uh, 450 uh, astronomical units up to 700. And there could be, in fact, a new planet there with a, a mass between five and 10 Earth masses. And there are many questions about that. Many people think that there may be a planet and maybe many people would like to check if it is the case. There has been a, um, a proposition by Scholz and Unwin that it may be a primordial black hole. In fact, it is exactly in the window B, the one with uh, uh, planet mass and black holes. And we decided to check what is the Hawking radiation of such black holes. So we for sure don't know the spin since we don't even know the mass and if it even exists. So you have the here the, the emission rate as a function of the fre frequency. And you see that such primordial black holes with uh, planet mass will emit with a size, uh, with a frequency of the gigahertz, so radio wave, in fact. <clears throat> so uh, we, we checked how much Hawking radiation uh, we could see from Earth. So you have the flux as a function of the distance from the, the black hole. So you see that the distance are very small. In fact, the scale is very small because radiation, Hawking radiation is too weak to be seen from Earth. Uh, whichever the case. It's the same for photons and for gravitational waves too. But if we had a black hole in the solar system, the possibility would be to send a probe to put it in orbit around the black hole and to study the emitted radio waves. It's possible maybe because it's radio waves, so you need to, to have an antenna. Uh, for gravitational waves, it would be more difficult, let's say. But they have, there are uh, many uh, proposals to, to, to study uh, far objects because the problem is that this kind of object is very far from us. So with standard uh, uh, probes, you would need uh, tens of years to go there, even more, in fact, um, maybe uh, 100 years. But there are proposals to build uh, very small satellites, very small probes, with masses of the order of the, of the gram, uh, with a, a sail, a solar sail that, um, that you push with a laser. It's a proof of, of concept. If you want to have a look, it's a breakthrough star, starshot project. And you can try, in fact, to send probes to, to see this kind of objects uh, with such a probe. OK. 
I, I want to make some uh, advert advertisement. So to, to generate the Hawking radiation spectrum, we have written a public code in C, which is completely public, open source, that you can download from the web page, which is called Blackhawk. So it uh, it has the uh, it well it is made to compute Hawking radiation for Schwarzschild and Kerr primordial black holes. It has all the primary spectra of standard model fundamental particles, but also the secondary spectra of stable particles, which have been hydronized, for example, with Pitya and Herwig. So you have protons, you have uh, electrons, uh, etc. It has extended mass functions, as I as presented um, in my previous slides, but also spin uh, spin distributions. It can simulate the time evolution of primordial black holes, and uh, as I said, it's completely open, and you can download it. Okay, I'm going to my conclusion. So. The main result is that we studied, in fact, the evolution of uh, primordial care black holes and the constraint from, from the, the gamma ray background. We studied uh, broad mass uh, distributions. So it brings, in fact, new information uh, on the exclusion. We know that there is still an open window for planet mass uh, black holes, and maybe planet nine exists and is a primordial black hole. So it's an open question. And I presented you uh, quickly the black code, public code to compute talking radiation. So the perspective is um, to try to, to find uh, new probes in order to close the remaining uh, primordial black holes mass windows for all dark matter or to discover, in fact, primordial black holes. There is the question uh, about uh, the possibility to use gravitational waves to, to find uh, a new way to, to look at primordial black holes. You are, we can maybe also use constraints from extrasolar planet searches to constrain uh, small primordial black holes and try to find other constraints. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Please use your raise hand uh, feature or post the question in the chat. I can maybe start with some very basic question. Uh, so if I recall correctly, for at least for classical gravitational wave emission, you need a time dependent quadrupole moment. Is this in this Hawking radiation picture uh, not the case? No. No, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not like that. In fact, it, it's a continuous uh, emission of gravitational waves. So it, it's mostly for something like, like LISA. It's not for LIGO Virgo. Yeah, so, so you see like a diffuse background of yeah. all uh, primary order. But, I mean, so you, but you, for the emission, you still need some time-dependent quadrupole moment from uh, black hole-black hole interactions. No, that, no yeah. not here, in fact. It's, in, in fact, what we have is really the emission of gravitons which are interpreted uh, as a gravitational wave. So the Hawking radiation, yeah. Yes. Okay. Are there other questions? Maybe one uh, more question from my side. Uh, so you mentioned uh, a test of uh, photon uh, in Hawking radiation and uh, why a comparison of measured photon backgrounds. Are you taking into account also the fact that these photon backgrounds are to some extent already modeled by astrophysical sources? Uh, I guess the limits that you derive there can be, could be um, also pushed uh, to, to uh, more constraining uh, values if you also include uh, astrophysical backgrounds in these uh, photon backgrounds. We, well, yes, we, we consider, in fact, well, we consider, considered it in the standard way. So we removed the background what, that we considered as standard model background. Mm -hmm. But of course, in fact, uh, you may have more sources um, that we do not consider here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any further question. Then uh, thank you, Alex. And uh, we move to the Next speaker. Hello. 
Jean-François. Yes. Hello. Did you uh, hear me? I can hear you and uh, we also see your slides. So then you're, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, uh, thanks to the uh, organizer for uh, allowing me to talk uh, at each chip. I will present uh, the work done with my uh, PhD advisor, uh, Alexander Bay, about uh, scalar fields uh, in cosmology and their uh, contents for uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Scalar fields appear in uh, many cosmological models, in particular in order to provide explanation for dark energy and inflation, but also to emulate dark matter. An idea is to replace simultaneously dark matter, dark energy, and inflations by one single scalar field. In the early universe, such scalar fields are not strongly constrained, except uh, by their impact on a Big Bang nucleosynthesis through uh, the observed abundance of the elements. In the first part, uh, I will present uh, fuzzy dark matter models in which uh, a scalar field behaves like dark matter, catesos models which can explain the recent uh, accelerations uh, of the expansion of the universe, and uh, dark fluid models which uh, unify dark energy and dark matter with the same and unique scalar field. Uh, in the second part, I will talk about uh, the triple unifications. Not only uh, of uh, dark energy and dark matter, but also inflation. The model assumes a non-minimal coupling to the gravity and a spontaneous uh, symmetry backing before inflation. After inflation, uh, the scalar fields behave like in the dark fluid uh, model. In the last part, uh, we will derive uh, the constraints uh, on a stable and a decaying uh, scalar field uh, from uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, let me begin with a quick reminder about the evolutions uh, of scalar fields in cosmology. For uh, an isotropic and homogeneous universe described by the Robertson and Walker metrics, the Einstein equations are given by uh, these two first equations and the Clyde Gordon by the third one. In these equations, the universe is composed of a scalar field, phi, uh, and other mean uh, radiations and baryonic matter. Uh, for uh, power law potentials, when the scalar field oscillates uh, around its minimum, the average of the, uh, of the energy density is simply a power law of the scale factor. For example, if n is equal to 2, in other words, a quadratic terms for the potential, the density will evolve like matter. For n equal to 4, the density will evolve like radiations. But these results are only valid when the scalar fields oscillates quickly around its minimum. During BBN, the scalar fields evolve differently, and we will see how for fuzzy dark matter models and quintessence models. So, first, uh, discussions on uh, cosmological scalar fields. The fuzzy dark matter models uh, aims at explaining dark matter with the scalar fields corresponding to an ultralight particle. M is uh, approximately equal to 10 power uh, minus 22 electron volt. It is really tiny, but this value comes uh, directly from the quantum wavelength. At galactic scale, uh, the scalar fields form boson chain core sets, which may constitute galaxy sized dark matter halos. For a typical halo of uh, 10 kiloparsec, the quantum wavelength, wavelength requires a mass uh, with this kind of value uh, as given by this uh, formula. Uh, the fuzzy dark matter model has been studied in the context of galactic uh, halos and it can reproduce the flat uh, spiral uh, galaxy rotation curves. 
Another important result of this model is a solid tonic behavior during uh, head one collisions between two galaxies, uh, which is compatible with the bullet cluster observation. Furthermore, uh, this model avoids the CUPSI halo and missing satellite problems. Uh, I will uh, discuss now the cosmological evolutions of fuzzy dark matter. The simplest model is a scalar field with a quadratic potential. The universe it is composed of radiations, uh, baryonic matter, cosmological constant, and a scalar field, uh, which replace cold dark matter in the uh, lambda CDM models. We can see uh, the uh, energy density fractions evolutions in these figures as a function of the scale factor. Uh, when the scalar fields uh, evolution is dominating by its kinetic uh, energy, uh, the density decays as a power minus six. Later, the potential is no longer ne negligible, and we can see a plateau. Uh, when the scalar field uh, oscillates quickly on its minimum, the energy density decays as uh, a power minus three uh, and uh, as uh, a dark matter behavior. Uh, the initial value of time derivative of phi uh, can be chosen arbitrarily and impact uh, the value of the energy density during the first step. And the uh, initial value of phi, phi is uh, taken to reproduce uh, the dark energy uh, density of all uh, dark matter. Uh, the potentials of this model is still uh, an open question. There is no strong contents given by the observations in the earlier universe. We can add a quadratic term in the potential. In this case, uh, the difference is the eighth of the plateau and uh, decay as a power minus four. Uh, Planck uh, data set a limit on lambda uh, as given by this formula. Finally, uh, the fuzzy dark matter models based on scalar fields can provide an explanation for cold dark matter. Cosmological scalar fields are also often used to mimic dark energy like incandescence model. In such models, uh, the cosmological constant is set to zero and replaced by a scalar field. Since all cosmological observations are currently compatible with a simple cosmological constant, the main features of such scenarios is a scalar field close to the dark energy value in the present uh, universe with an equation of state close to uh, minus one. Uh, for a tracking model characterized by the inverse power law of potential, the equation of states is shown in these figures as a function of the scale factor. And we can see that P equal to one is excluded because uh, the equation of state is not enough close to one, minus one today must be smaller than 0 0.105. The difference with the lambda CDM models is that the energy density of the scalar fields is expected to evolve and could have played a role at early stage of the expansion of the universe. To conclude, Cantesos models based on scalar fields can replace the cosmological constant. The dark field model aims at unifying dark matter and dark energy with a single scalar field. The potentials of the simple dark field models is given by a constant. We could reproduce the dark energy with a value directly uh, given by the cosmological uh, constant and a uh, quadratic terms which could replace cold dark matter like in the fuzzy dark matter model. Uh, one can modify uh, this potential by adding, for example, uh, an exponential in front of the constant. Uh, as we can see in these figures, the universe is composed of radiations, baryonic matter, and uh, scalar fields. One scalar fields which replace uh, dark matter and dark energy. 
So, in dark green models, a single scalar fields can replace both dark matter and dark energy simultaneously. In this section, we will build a model in which inflation can be simultaneously explained within a dark fluid model. Details uh, about this model can be found in this article. Uh, scalar fields are ubiquitous in cosmology. One possibility to reduce the number is to unify dark energy, fuzzy dark matter, and inflation which can all be described by scalar fields. We have already seen that uh, dark field models replace dark energy and dark matter by a single scalar field. Another possibility is to unify inflation and dark energy, which lead to a two-stage of accelerated gas function. A third possibility is to unify inflation and dark matter, which can come from the incomplete decay of inflation. In such model, the standard chaotic inflation scalar field survives with a mass which is six orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck mass. Several models of triple unifications have uh, already studied, but this model do not explain dark matter as in the fuzzy dark matter model. I will now present a more natural triple unification scenario by assuming a non-minimal coupling to the gravity and a symmetry breaking before inflation. The, models, uh, the model is uh, defined by the, this action. Uh, the uh, action here is uh, invariant under Z2 symmetry. For phi equal to uh, zero, the potential has a local maximum. Therefore, the theory is unstable around this value. The two minima correspond to phi equal to plus v and minus v. When the scalar fields goes to one of these minima, the Z2 uh, symmetry is spontaneously broken. Psi, uh, is the variation of the scalar fields around this uh, the minimum. After the symmetry breaking, by replacing phi by xi, the action uh, is given by uh, this one. So, uh, after symmetry breaking, if we neglect the scalar field variation xi, only the air and uh, R square terms have an impact on the uh, universe evolution. The R square term produces an inflationary period which will be similar to one of the Starbinsky inflation. This action can be transformed into the uh, ancient frame where the R square degree of freedom is uh, interpreted as a scalar field. In uh, the ancient frame, we find uh, several uh, inflations, uh, which is uh, compatible with the cosmological microwave background. Uh, the uh, amplitude of the power spectrum fixes the constant uh, alpha wave square uh, to uh, 10 power 9. Uh, the uh, inflation period starts at phi psi equal to phi Planck mass and ends at phi psi equal to uh, one Planck mass. After inflation, the uh, inflaton uh, decays into radiations and reates uh, the scalar field uh, chi psi. Uh, the scalar field psi, uh, which appear after the symmetry breaking and uh, characterize the variation around the minimum, will evolve as in the simplest dark field model when neglecting the higher order storms of the potential. The scalar fields uh, replace dark energy thanks to the V0 constant and uh, dark matter thanks to the mass term. The C3 and C4 terms have negligible effect. Uh, this uh, can be seen in this figure. For example, the average 
the dark matter density in galaxies is obtained for a value of psi larger than 10 uh, power 22 uh, electron volt. And in this case, uh, the C3 uh, terms is seven order of magnitude smaller than the mass term, and the C4 terms is uh, 14 uh, order of magnitude smaller than the mass term. So, uh, the model that I presented can unify dark energy, dark matter, and inflation with only one scalar field. Uh, with all the scalar fields, the observed uh, abundance of the elements can be modified. In the following, we will derive the constraints and the scalar field scenario from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, these constraints uh, are detailed in this article. Uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, is generally considered to occur during radiation dominations. The total uh, energy density, mainly composed of uh, photons, electrons, positrons, baryons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, and dark matter. Uh, for a temperature of about uh, 1 mega electrovolt, the uh, hydrogen nuclei can fuse into helium nuclei. The main uh, process are shown in these figures. These reactions freeze out because of the universe expansion. The, the observational measurements give this limit on the analysis. In the standard cosmological models, the theoretical predictions obtained using uh, Alter Bibian public code, for example, are given here. The helium-4, helium-3, and deuterium analysis are compatible with measurements. But there is a conflict with lithium-7 abundance. In this part, we will discuss the theoretical predictions when adding a scalar field to the total energy density. The density of the scalar field is taken as a power law of the scale factor and modifies the abundance of the elements via modifications of uh, Hubble rate. These figures show the abundances of helium-4, uh, helium-3, uh, deuterium, and uh, lithium as a function of the decreases exponent n and of the initial scalar fields density normalized to the photon density at uh, 1 mega electron volt. The standard cosmological model is recovered with a null density. The dashed line represents the individual uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis constraints, except for lithium, the excluded regions are above the line. We can also see that, the, that, that there is no point where the abundances of elements are all compatible with observations. It is like the standard cosmological models. If one uh, disregards the lithium constraints, considering the key square with helium-3, 4, and deuterium, we obtain this limit. Uh, for n equal to 4, the limit can be reinterpreted as three extra species of neutrino. Now, uh, we consider a scalar fields with decay into radiation during BBN. The evolution of the scalar field density is given by the Clang gordon equation with, uh, in addition, a decaying constant gamma. The rating temperature is defined by this formula. Uh, these figures show the evolution of the decaying scalar fields density, matter density, and radiation density as a function of the scale factor. Uh, we can see an increase in radiation density, which corresponds to the rating. Considering the evolution of this density, it is possible to make uh, theoretical predictions for uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. These figures show value of helium-4, helium-3, lithium abundances uh, as a function of the rating temperature for n equal to 3, 4, and 6. The dashed lines represent uh, the key square contents by thinking as expected. Finally, for a decaying scalar field, 
the observation of constant give this limit. To conclude, we have seen that fuzzy dark matter behaves as dark matter. Cartier source model has dark energy, and that is possible to have a single scalar field replacing simultaneously dark matter, dark, uh, dark energy, and inflation. Furthermore, we have derived constants and stable and uh, decaying scalar field uh, from uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, uh, Francois. Uh, other questions? Please, please always raise hand with your. Francois, you, you mentioned tensions in uh, theoretical predictions and experimental measurements of the lithium abundance. Uh, so I wonder if, if you want to convey here that with this um, uh, triple unification model, you can also try uh, also make a shift in prediction in the field of predictions aligned with the prediction of the system. Um, actually, uh, uh, with this uh, model, we have seen the, uh, the cannot. Uh, be agree with uh, the con uh, the constants of uh, lithium seven as we can uh, see here. So uh, in this case, it's for general scalar fields. Though it is uh, uh, the same for the triple unification. It's not a quadruple unification model. You get one extra. Um, if you think of uh, other. Um, Measurements, for example, measurements for uh, the model power factor that can also give you some uh, tests of this model. Test the triple uh, unification models? Yeah. Um, uh, actually, to uh, test uh, it, uh, we can uh, test uh, with a cosmological uh, microwave uh, backdrop by putting some uh, limits on uh, lambda, as we uh, already seen for uh, uh, dark, uh, fuzzy dark matter models. So it puts some limit on lambda. So uh, we could uh, study uh, the constant uh, in a low uh, density after CMB or for uh, galaxy formations, uh, but uh, it uh, reproduces the fuzzy dark matter model. So if we test the fuzzy dark matter model, we test the triple unifications actually. And if we test the Starobinsky inflations, we test the triple unifications. Though, so in this sense, we can test the, the triple unification by, uh, by a part. In this case, we have this behavior, we can test it. And, uh, and so on. And uh, the same for uh, dark energy. Right? And uh, we uh, here, uh, at, uh, where it is, sorry. Yes, here uh, we could uh, test uh, the potentials, for example, if uh, V is uh, small, but uh, as a um, as there are uh, contents on uh, B, but we could increase this content uh, for uh, measurements if we have a disagree with the model, actually. Uh, so we could uh, test uh, the triple unification via the potential, but it's not the only possibility to do the symmetry breaking, actually. OK, thank you. Um, I don't see any nice hands, questions in the chat. So uh, thank you, Jean Vassois, for your talk. And uh, we come to the next talk, which uh, is uh, by Achille uh, uh, Arthur. Yeah, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Yes, it's in the cloud. Yeah, hello. Try to share. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Okay. And uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. 
okay. This one. Make it full screen. Yes. You're here now? Yes, this looks good. Thank you. Okay, excellent. All right. First of all, uh, good morning, everyone in Prague or Europe. Um, and uh, I, I would like to ask, uh, thank Marcus, first of all, and uh, also the uh, speakers of this session for, for accommodating my, um, you know, very short notice request and uh, for rescheduling this talk. Um, okay, so uh, what I will be talking about is um, something which we uh, are doing with my students here in Sydney. Uh, and this concerns about um, monopoles uh, within the electronic sector of the standard model, so-called electronic uh, monopoles, uh, and uh, they're all in electronic uh, biogenesis. Um, all right, so I, I want to start my talk with the question, what is the next energy scale uh, to be probed in, in uh, particle physics? And uh, this is, of course, a very important question, uh, especially now when we do not see at colliders any anticipated uh, before uh, evidence for new physics. Um, and uh, if, if you look uh, carefully at what we have at hand, uh, you know, the evidence of the standard model, the first one is, of course, the neutrino masses. And uh, so what you can do without any prejudice about the neutrino masses, just taking the fact that the neutrino masses exist and writing down uh, them in the standard model Lagrangian, then uh, the usual way to, uh, to judge whether this theory is correct or not, or applicability of theory, is to extrapolate this to the high energies. And you know that uh, if you compute, for example, these diagrams of neutrino scattering uh, with the production of um, uh, longitudinal electronic bosons, uh, you will find out that the uh, unitarity of the theory is violated somewhere in 10 to 11 GeV. So incidentally, this is very close to um, the uh, neutrino CISO scale. So very, very high scale, which we can't presume to probe in any uh, visible future uh, at colliders. Uh, no, another uh, evidence for this uh, um, physics beyond the standard model is of course dark matter. This is not uh, from the particle physics perspective, this is not that robust evidence because it involves only gravitational interaction. However, if you assume certain type of dark matter, uh, uh, so so-called WIMP dark matter, or thermally uh, produced uh, weakly interacting uh, standard model particles, uh, particles, and then uh, you can deduce uh, that uh, their abundance uh, are related inversely proportional to thermally average uh, cross section. And uh, this cross section has also bounds, unitary bounds, uh, and uh, uh, which gives you a bound on the mass of the beam particle, which is less than 100 TeV. Again, um, that is possible to detect uh, uh, at LHC in principle, but uh, we do not see uh, any evidence of WIMPs yet. And of course, the beam is only one corner now of, uh, of uh, the dark matter paradigms. There are many other uh, models. So in fact, what you want to argue is that uh, the next scale, uh, which uh, is interesting to probe, uh, is actually around the corner. And uh, this is related to the non-perturbative effects in the standard model. Uh, and in particular to um, the Sphaleron transitions. Uh, now, we know that uh, an, uh, sector, gauge sector of the standard model and the electronic sector uh, has non-trivial vacua and the transition between these two vacuas can occur uh, because of uh, the electronic instantons. And there are uh, various processes, uh, exotic processes associated with these uh, transitions. In particular, there are P minus uh, 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 baryon and lepton number violating processes by three units, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, however, um, being non-perturbative, these processes are extremely suppressed, uh, at least at the energies we know. And the barrier which uh, which gives this suppression now uh, the quant for quantum tunneling is uh, is about 10 TeV. So this is roughly a so-called um, uh, Sphaleron mass. So in principle, if we can overcome this barrier, we would see very interesting physics. And this is presumably the next scale uh, uh, to be probed uh, 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 in particle physics, assuming that we can uh, probe it. Um, 
Now, so there is uh, certain uh, questions about the accessibility of this scale, and uh, these questions are related exactly to what I said, but I will uh, return to this um, uh, in my talk. Now, what I uh, next, what I want to uh, talk about uh, quickly about the monopoles by itself, uh, the magnetic um, uh, charges, and uh, just this slide to remind you uh, that the Maxwell's electromagnetism is a triumph of uh, symmetry in physics. It embodies uh, relativistic invariance, and uh, through through that, uh, it gives a common description of electric and magnetic phenomena. And of course, there is a still a not quite symmetric uh, distribution of uh, electric and magnetic charges, uh, prediction of electric and magnetic charges uh, within the standard model. And in particular, a stand, a standard electromagnetism does not predict uh, uh, electric charges and the currents. So, uh, as you know, back in the 30s, uh, Dirac uh, proposed more symmetric. Um, a formulation of uh, electromagnetism, uh, the electromagnetism by including uh, uh, magnetic uh, charges as well. And the symmetry of these equations now uh, are enhanced, uh, as you can see, um, beca because of this, uh, there are extra duality symmetries of exchange of electric and magnetic fields and electric and magnetic charges. Uh, if, you, uh, if you assume that uh, uh, magnetic uh, monopoles exist, but uh, there is a price to pay for that uh, um, of magnetic monopoles, at least in the electromagnetism. Uh, you have to introduce uh, something what we call uh, um, um, uh, singular singular potentials, uh, so singular vector potential, for example. And this this is known as a, a Dirac string. However, what, what was pointed out by Dirac is that the singularity in the vector potential, which is not uh, observable quantity, is not a problem. And moreover, if you assume that this uh, configuration exists, that means the magnetic monopoles exist, then uh, we have, um, from the quantum perspective, we have uh, the explanation from the quantization of uh, electric charges. This is a famous Dirac uh, quantization condition. Now, so this looks like a very interesting object, uh, of course, and it's certainly theoretically possible. The only problem, of course, with uh, monopoles in the electromagnetism, the Dirac monopoles, is that uh, if we compute uh, the energy of the configuration, uh, of the monopole configuration, we see that the energy uh, of the monopoles, which is static energy, which, which is essentially the mass of the monopole, are divergent for very small uh, scales when R goes to zero. And this divergence means that, uh, you know, the theory of electromagnetism has to be somehow regulated at very, very short scales in the ultraviolet if we believe that to the existence of these magnetic charges. Now, back in the 70s, though, um, Tulta Polakov, uh, you know, suggested um, a variant of this uh, regularization uh, by embedding, for example, U1 gauge theory into the non abelian NC2 which is spontaneously broken down to U1. And you all know that there are, um, uh, again, um, the configurations which uh, at large distances look like exactly as a, uh, as a Dirac monopole. However, at small distances, uh, they are regulated. And so you have this mass of the monopole or energy of the monopole, uh, which is uh, quite close to the uh, similar to the energy of the monopoles, the uh, spherons I mentioned before. Now, another thing about uh, um, uh, this hot polar monopoles is that uh, they are stable configurations. This is very important, and the stability of, of this configuration, as you know, uh, uh, are ensured by the non-trivial topology. The second homotopy group uh, is non-trivial in this particular case. So, if we have this situation, this uh, this type of monopoles uh, in the uh, uh, then uh, of course and in cosmologically uh, phase transitions corresponding phase to phase transition, then the top uh, the, the uh, monopoles are not any more optional. They are kind of mandatory. They will be produced, and because of the stability, they will uh, stay around uh, today. Now, however. Of course, the standard model is not uh, electromagnetism. is not just uh, U1 theory. Uh, we know that, and uh, of course, um, in the standard model, we don't have just SU2 theory and the triplet scalar. Instead, we have uh, SU2 U1 electroweak gauge group, which is spontaneously broken down to U1 electromagnetism. 
and um, by the uh, Higgs mechanism and the Higgs field here uh, is uh, of course the standard Higgs field which is electrolytic doublet now so for a long time it, it was believed that uh, uh, because of this particular situation, uh, because of this particular vacuum manifold of the Higgs field, there are no topologically stable uh, monopoles in within the standard model in the electrobic theory. But this uh, turns out to be plain wrong, and uh, let me try to explain why is that. So the usual, um, uh, you know, uh, argument why. Uh, the topology is trivial for potential uh, monopole solutions in electrobic theory is the following. So if you take now the vacuum manifold of the Higgs field, it's given by this uh, equation over here. And, um, and so it represents now a uh, three manifold rather than two manifold in the hopp polakov model. And therefore, uh, if you want to wrap two, uh, two sphere, which is the uh, boundary on uh, spatial infinity onto the three sphere, which is um, a vacuum manifold, of course, this wrapping is trivial. And therefore, that was the usual assumption uh, that uh, there are no ele stable electrophic monopoles uh, within the standard model. However, um, uh, in the 90s, uh, in the middle of 90s, Cho and Mason proposed the uh, ansatz and the solution for the monopoles, electrobic monopoles, which is a um, some kind of uh, mixture between the Toft polyco and the Dirac monopole. So it's a singular ansatz and it's given uh, in certain gauge uh, here. Uh, the H is the Higgs field, A is the field uh, gauge field, um, triplet of the gauge fields of SU2, and B is a uh, hypercharged gauge field. And you can see that at theta equal pi over 2, there is a singular both in the Higgs field and, and in the gauge field configuration. Now, so this reminds us um, that uh, it contains also kind of a Dirac construction. So, uh, that singularity is uh, basically what uh, prevents uh, this typical argument about uh, about uh, the triviality of uh, the vacuum manifold in the standard model. Because, uh, for example, if you have a three sphere and you pinch it, it's topologically not anymore three sphere, but something else. So to see what it is, uh, you can uh, work with this uh, complex coordinate in the field space. And uh, rearrange uh, the potential taking certain gauge uh, transformation to removing the um, uh, divergences from uh, the gauge fields, the uh, two gauge fields, but they still remain in the Higgs field and and uh, uh, and the B fields. So this is the construction which is known as the Wu Yang construction. So when you define a different uh, fields uh, on a different patches to avoid uh, um, to avoid uh, singularities. Now, however, the transition function at the um, at the equator is a holomorphic function. It's just basically uh, exponent to the power i phi, and therefore, by definition, uh, you know that that one and the two coordinate uh, actually span a projective uh, complex plane rather than um, a three sphere. And the projective complex plane, or in other words, Riemann sphere, known in mathematics, uh, have um, is topologically. Uh, equivalent to two sphere, and therefore the vacuum manifold indeed uh, for this type of solutions, the mapping is non trivial. Now, of course, um, uh, um, okay, of course, uh, if this is true, then uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, topologically non trivial vacuum uh, monopoles. Uh, electrobic monopoles, and these monopoles uh, mediate so-called um, baryon number and lepton number violating processes similar to the phalerons. Actually, if you look uh, very carefully in the configuration of two monopoles, uh, 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 they can form the bound state, which uh, which uh, reminds uh, very much as phalerons. Okay. So now we know from one hand that the monopole uh, particle scattering uh, is unsuppressed. Uh, this is a particular effect known as the rubakov gallon effect. And so, but, and so one can assume also by just crossing symmetry that also the production of uh, the monopole-antimonopole pair will be also unsuppressed. 
So this is something which is a very generic uh, argument. However, it needs to be verified by calculations, of course. So the claim here is that it might be that uh, indeed we can produce this monopole and monopole pair without exponential suppression, which I mentioned for uh, Svalerons. Now, another important effect of the existence of these monopoles is um, Um, yes, oh, I, I don't see actually the timing. Uh, Marcos, can you can you tell me how much left for me? Um, I think you have about 10 minutes left, if I'm correct. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, another important uh, effect, which is um, which uh, which this which which comes with these monopoles, electrovic monopoles is the extra uh, theta phase or the uh, CP violating phase, which can uh, uh, appear in the electroweak theory. And this phase is actually, we, you have presumably known, uh, familiar with this phase uh, in the axiom physics or strong QCD CP problem, but uh, in usually it's believed that in electroweak sector, these uh, theta phases can be removed by, um, by the rotation of quarks by the redefinition of quarks, the phases of quarks. But this is not true uh, if you have the monopole in your sector. Uh, and in particular, something what we will call a theta electroweak remains in the spectrum, which is uh, the physical, as a physical phase, which is the uh, difference of uh, theta terms of the SU2 and hypercharge uh, fields. Um, now, of course, this uh, extra CP violation will have some effects uh, and contribute to EDM uh, of known particles through the exchange of uh, monopoles. However, uh, these uh, processes uh, for the monopoles who we'll, we are discussing are quite suppressed, so there, is, there are no uh, constraints from there. But another thing is that, that uh, the existence of these monopoles, now, now since we established the violation of P and L, um, a baryon number and the extra source of CP violation uh, may lead to a successful um, electroweak uh, baryogenesis. Now, before I go to the baryogenesis scenario, let me uh, talk about the monopole mass again. Uh, if you just uh, remain within the standard model, uh, since uh, this contraction reminds uh, the Dirac construction, uh, the monopole mass is infinity. So one need to regulate that in a certain way. And so we um, considered a string inspired extension of the standard model where the say hypercharge, uh, hypercharge field or SU2 are written in a born infield um, form, the kinetic term for those fields. And, um, and uh, have considered the various um, constraints which are coming from the non-linear, say, electromagnetism, uh, which is induced by this born infield parameter beta. Now, first of all, you can uh, regulate by this uh, non-linearity the monopole mass, and the monopole mass is now given like this. And the constraints on the beta parameter from uh, the, the non-linearity in the pro propagation of light uh, gives the monopole mass of uh, about 3 TeV. However, later on, uh, Ellis and Mauro Matos and you uh, have pointed out that um, data from LHC actually uh, uh, on the light by light scattering on constraints, like, constraints this parameter even, uh, there are even stronger constraints on this parameter. So the monopole mass uh, today constrained from the observations uh, is about 10 TeV. So if you want to produce these monopoles at colliders, you need at least, since they are producing pairs, you need at least 20 TeV collider, okay? Um, now uh, let me discuss now uh, the baryogen as a scenario of these monopoles. So uh, here, you know, you are all familiar with the three um, conditions for the baryogenesis uh, to occur dynamically in the early universe. One is the violation of uh, baryon number and the C and CP violation. And uh, if we are talking about electroweak baryogenesis, we need some type of uh, departure from thermal equilibrium. And that could be provided by uh, if uh, the electroweak phase transition is of first order. Now, in the standard model, we know that the baryon uh, number violation are mediated by sphalerons. C and CP is violated through the CKM matrix. 
but the departure from thermal equilibrium is not first order, okay? So now, if there are monopoles also in the electrovic se sector, we have additional violation of baryon uh, number to be mediated by monopoles, uh, additional CP violation uh, through the electrovic theta phase. And I will uh, argue that uh, uh, also uh, the production of uh, monopoles induce uh, strongly first order phase transition. So how the monopoles are produced? Uh, well, this is a typical story. Uh, we have uh, through the cable mechanism in the early universe. So we have uh, the phase transition uh, happening, uh, electric phase transition uh, with uh, um, bubbles of um, new phase uh, expanding in, uh, in the false vacuum. And uh, it could happen that uh, some topological defects can form uh, while this uh, phase transition takes place. And the core of this topological defects uh, can describe the core of the monopoles, in fact. So one can, of course, uh, the calculation of density by production of monopoles is, uh, uh, is very complicated. But the, as an order of magnitude estimation, you can estimate uh, this like this. So if you have a 10 to 7 uh, GeV uh, mass monopole, then uh, uh, the density is 10 to minus 26 per cubic centimeter. Uh, all right, so, so the monopoles are produced during uh, electroweak phase transition. And at the same time, what they do, they distort uh, the uh, second, uh, you know, smooth transition, uh, the so-called so uh, of electroweak, usual electroweak phase smooth transition. And, uh, and induce uh, this uh, uh, induce uh, deviation from, uh, from um, uh, thermal equilibrium. Uh, so the energetics of, uh, of this uh, uh, transition, you can uh, look, looking at the critical temperature and the uh, value of the uh, Higgs field uh, at the critical temperature. So the energetics tells you that the Gibbs energy, free energy, uh, which is actually a thermal potential at the origin at, uh, and at non-zero VV, thermal VV of the Higgs field uh, has to be equal to each other. Uh, but now, since we have also production of monopoles, there is the extra energy, the extra energy cost uh, to produce those uh, monopoles. Uh, and of course, if we estimate the density of the monopoles, the monopoles are very massive and they are um, non-relativistic particles. So the density multiplied by mass is actually the energy density of the monopoles. And so you can solve this equation for the mass uh, versus Fc of a Tc, which uh, basically gives you a strength uh, first of the first or the uh, departure from the uh, smooth transition. And if Fc of a Tc is bigger than one, then you see that uh, the transition is uh, the transition is actually uh, strongly first order, in a sense that the spiral processes are ineffective in the program phase. So if we have if we uh, have uh, the production of baryon asymmetry, it won't be washed out later on. Now, so for this uh, to happen, the mass of the monopole has to be quite heavy. So you need a large density in here. Uh, and so it should be bigger than this number. Now, of course, uh, the density of monopoles cannot be uh, arbitrarily large because there is a constraint from the BBN, the usual constraint from BBN. Uh, the monopoles should not dominate the BBN era. And the constraint from there comes uh, on the mass of the monopoles and equal to 2.3, 10, uh, 10 to 4. Now, of course, there is a large uncertainty in these calculations. However, it's quite uh, amusing that it narrows down to a very, very narrow region uh, of potential region for the uh, monopoles which work for the pathogenesis. Now, again, I'll remind you that uh, uh, we have a non-zero uh, theta phase, which is uh, in, in this particular case, in the presence of monopole in the electronic sector. And uh, uh, so, oops. And so we have uh, essentially all ingredients uh, to generate non-zero um, baryon uh, asymmetry. And, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, set up uh, the very simple uh, Boltzmann-like equation for the baryon asymmetry. So the production of each pair, each baryon uh, would correspond to the CP violating process 
which uh, goes uh, with uh, with uh, with the monopoles. And uh, this Boltzmann equation can be solved very sim uh, in a simple way. And of course, uh, everything depends on this uh, linearly on this theta CP violating parameter and the density of uh, initial density of um, produce uh, monopoles. And so we can express uh, later on everything in terms of a critical temperature, um, uh, fine structure constant, uh, and, and this uh, CP violating parameter. And of course, uh, you can tune the CP violating parameter since this is not constrained at all so far. Uh, to be 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 2, in order to reproduce uh, the uh, desired asymmetry in variance. Okay, so uh, you can uh, you can generate quite um, naturally the baryon asymmetry through these monopoles. Okay, uh, let me uh, uh, go to my conclusions now. That the first thing is to uh, try to convey. Um, the message that the electrovic mo monopoles are inescapable prediction of the standard model. Uh, and there are very interesting uh, physics behind of this once you accept that. Uh, first of all, there is uh, um, electrovic uh, extra CP violating fuzz just in electrovic theory, uh, which is known as electrovic CP uh, theta term. Uh, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, there is a uh, very interesting physics associated with the light uh, monopoles, uh, which should be uh, larger than 10 TeV, as I argued, um, uh, because there is the particular, pro uh, particular spectacular processes of multiparticle processes with uh, delta B delta L equal to 3 violation uh, in the collision, for example, of protons. Uh, but at least you need the energies uh, to probe these uh, monopoles. At least you need the energies with the current constraint. You need the energies uh, bigger than 20 TeV. Uh, and finally, if you have uh, heavy monopoles enough, around 10 to 7 GeV, uh, they can drive the first order electrovic phase transition and to guarantee you successful biogenesis. Now, these heavy monopoles presumably need to be looked in uh, astrophysical experiments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Achil. Are there questions? Please use the chat or raised hand feature. Uh, here on the last slide, you mentioned astrophysical experiments. Is this uh, referring to the possibility that these uh, electroweak monopoles could be a contribution of dark matter or a strong contribution of dark matter? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, well, well, what I was referring actually is that you can, well, I mean, the uh, monopoles, uh, you know, produce, of course, um, non-relativistic, but they, uh, these mass monopoles, which are actually the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, what is called the middle range masses of the monopoles are quite, you know, uh, they, they are accelerated very rapidly in, uh, in uh, magnetic fields. So they are relativistic. So they produce, for example, Cherenkov radiation. Right, and so you can detect in principle those uh, events in ice cube, uh, say, or in cosmic rays and uh, things like that. So this is what I meant uh, astrophysical observation. Of course, there are limits on uh, on already existing limits on this. But if you believe in the picture which I was talking about, the fluxes are still small. If you, you can compute the flux of the multiple, still small. So this is uh, still presumably awaits its discovery. Now, the question of dark matter is extremely interesting as well. And now I don't have a qualitative answer to these questions, but uh, I think the fluxes, if you believe again to the parigen of the scenario, uh, fluxes are too low to account for the whole dark matter. The monopoles. But uh, yeah, so I'm familiar with measurements at neutrino telescopes. Also the, the uh, non-relativistic monopoles can be can be even more interesting if they induce uh, proton decay by via this Kalan Rubakov effect that yeah. you uh, mentioned. Uh, so, yeah. would, so, uh, yeah. so, a secondary Cherenkov emission and a, a slow chain of, of um, uh, Cherenkov bursts as the particle crosses the detector. Yes, that's 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 exactly. I mean, there is a lot of things that are going on, and there are some particular things uh, with the electrovic monopoles. So, for example, electrovic monopoles do not induce a proton decay. Okay. Right. So they do not induce proton decay. However, they induce the processes baryon and la lepton number violation. So since they do not induce the proton decay, you can avoid a lot of bounds already existing. 
but they still, you know, induce a very, you know, uh, secondary radiation, as you mentioned, this, uh, through this multi-particle processes, right? Uh, so, yes, I mean, this is something very interesting to look at. Yeah. yeah, I was confusing this with gut monopoles, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so th there is a particular differences there, there with the gut monopoles, but uh, yes, indeed, um, in general, this is an interest to look at. Okay, I don't see any other uh, questions or raised hands. Then, Achil, thank you very much. And also thank you to the other speakers of this block. And uh, we have now another coffee break for 30 minutes, we are going to reconvene uh, at uh, 20 minutes to 12. See you soon. Thank you.
Hi, Francesca, are you still on the call? Okay, never mind. Talk to you later. Uh, Francesca, I see you now. Do you want to test your audio? Yes, please. Hi. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, so I, I can hear you. And uh, do you also want to? Um, I try. Yes. Yeah. That already looks good. Maybe if you do full screen. It's not in full screen. It, it, I mean, it's almost full screen. Uh, it's acceptable. Yeah, uh, it's strange. However, in my screen is full screen, so. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's fine. There's just, you know, like a toolbar on top, but that, that's, that shouldn't be okay. any problem. That's fine. I can try again, just in case. I don't know. It's the same. It, it is the same. Yeah. Yeah, Francesca, but, uh, when you yes, share okay. your Francesca, when you share your screen, it offers you different windows. Uh, uh -huh. Try out the full desktop sharing. Yeah, yeah. The that's full what, desktop instead of the specific. Uh, exactly. Yes, the full desktop. That's what works. I see. So I stop sharing. Share the screen. Whiteboard? No. No, it's not maybe. the one. Ah, the desktop one, yes. Now I see, maybe. And then this way. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, Francesca. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> thank you for your suggestion.
Hi, uh, Jia Hui Wai. I, hope yes. I, can yeah. I just saw your message, your yeah. private message. If you want, you can quickly test. Uh, uh, okay. Yes, we are, okay. the audio is working already. Uh, so, did you see it in full screen? Yeah, I think something. Yeah. I and see. the laser pointer is working also. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks. I see that Francesco is also um, on the call. Do you also want to uh, test out your screen sharing? I see that you have not um, submitted your talk to Indico, so I won't be able to share the screen for you. Francesco, are you, are you there? I see that your mic is open, but I cannot hear you. Okay, maybe we can sort this out. Maybe we can okay, start. good morning. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. okay, good morning. Sorry for not uh, uploading on Indico. I will try to do it now. Yeah. You still have time. You, okay, you I can try to share, uh, do if a test of quickly. sharing now. Uh, can I do a test now of uh, my sharing? Yeah, you can. Yeah, if, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Can you yeah, that's see it full screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks. I will try to upload it in the meantime. Good, thank you. So um, yeah, welcome back to uh, the session. Uh, if you are uh, joining us for the first time, please use the um, raise hand option uh, in Zoom if you want to ask a question at the end of the talks, uh, or you can also post your question on the Zoom chat or you. Uh, the, the matter most chat and uh, Alexei will send you a reminder about the link uh, during the uh, during the talks and uh, so we, we change topic now in the third uh, block today we are going to uh, hear about recent measurements uh, of uh, AMS on board the International Space Station and the first talk is by Francesca. Okay I'm going to share my screen. Do you see it? Looks good. Okay, great. So, uh, hello everybody. I'm Francesca Giovacchini from CMAT. And uh, today I'm going to present on behalf of the MSO2 collaboration, the properties of cosmic helium isotopes measured by the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Okay, so the cosmic rays are commonly uh, grouped in two categories, uh, primary cosmic rays, uh, Ion, uh, ionized nuclei like uh, proton, uh, helium, carbon, and oxygen, which are produced and accelerated at their, their sources, like uh, supernova remnants, and uh, they propagate through the galaxy uh, before eventually enriching us. Uh, this energy spectrum of the primary cosmic rays provides information on the injected spectrum at the source and on the propagation processes that these cosmic rays uh, went through during their journey in the galaxy. The secondary cosmic rays, like lithium, beryllium, and boron, but also deuterons and helium-3, are instead produced by the primary cosmic rays in their collision with the interstellar medium. Their energy spectrum depends on the energy spectrum of the parent elements, so the primary cosmic rays, and on the propagation process through the galaxy. Therefore, the... Um, uh, secondary to primary ratio, flux ratio, like lithium over oxygen, beryllium over oxygen, etc., factors out 
the source spectrum of the progenitor and provides information to constrain the transport parameter in the propagation models. And the knowledge and understanding of the uh, propagation of cosmic rays in the galaxy is important not only by itself, but also um, to, in the search of new physics um, in order to model the to yes to model the background and be able to significantly disentangle the new uh, effect the, the the extra signal with respect to the background and uh, AMS provides precise measurement of both primary and secondary cosmic rays like you will see from my colleagues uh, in the presentation of tomorrow and the um, helium uh, isotopes are um, a special case of these secondary and primary uh, species. The helium uh, in cosmic rays are the second most abundant nuclei consisting of two isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. The helium-4 is thought to be mainly produced and accelerated in astrophysical sources, so it's a typical primary. The, the helium-3 is mostly produced by fragmentation of the helium-4, so it's a typical secondary. The distinct origin of these two isotopes, so helium-3 secondary and helium-4 primary, and the single fragmentation channel in the production of the helium-3 from the helium-4, allows a simpler comparison with the projection model with respect to heavier, super, uh, heavier secondary to primary nuclei ratio like boron over carbon and boron over oxygen, where uh, the lithium, beryllium, and boron are uh, produced by uh, multi, uh, multiple fragmentation channel uh, from several many uh, heavier nuclei that interacts with the interstellar medium. In addition, the small cross-section of the helium with respect to heavier nuclei allows the helium-3 over helium-4 flux ratio to probe the properties of the diffusion at larger distances, sampling larger volumes uh, to any other secondary to primary ratio. And uh, it also allows to test the universality of the propagation for different A over Z. With AMS, we measure the, the flux of helium. Uh, um, we published this measurement in 2015. Here I show you an update of this measure, be, measurement based on 125 million helium events uh, collected during the first uh, 6.5 years of data taking. In this plot, the AMS uh, measurement in red are together with uh, the most recent results from other experiments and plotted as, as function of the kinetic energy per nucleon. Uh, as you can see, the, the energy range of our measurement is wide uh, and range from the uh, fraction of uh, JEV up to the TEV with the percent level precision around 100 gigavolt. Uh, the cosmic rays uh, which are uh, um, arriving uh, at the heliosphere are expected to be subject to um, variation which depends on the uh, solar activity. And uh, with the EMS, uh, with this uh, uh, large acceptance, uh, um, high precision uh, detection capabilities and uh, the long mission duration, we measured and published the um, flux of helium as a function of uh, time uh, uh, in the region between 1.9 and uh, 60 gigavolt uh, from May 2011 to May 2017 in 20, covering 29 barter rotation over cycle, uh, solar cycle 24. Uh, here I displayed in five uh, selected rigidity bins where you can see that at low rigidity, the flux of helium is not uh, time independent. Instead, we see variation in time and the amplitude of this variation uh, decrease with increasing uh, rigidity. And uh, um, at um, around one, about one year after the, the solar maximum, we also see that uh, the, the flux uh, steadily increases. AMS is a multi -pre precision multipurpose spectrometer uh, operating in space at 400 kilometers orbit. It's made of several specialized subdetector for, um, for a redundant particle identification. The helium nuclei are identified by their, their charge, which in AMS is measured repeatedly all around, uh, along the particle trajectory inside the detector from the top to the bottom with good resolution. 
For this specific uh, measurement, we use the measurement uh, of the charge in the layer one, in the upper time of flight, in the seven uh, layer of the tracker, and in the lower time of flight. And this results to a negligible misidentification, uh, keeping, however, an efficiency pretty high, above 98%. Uh, using the information of the, um, of the charge in the first layer on top of AMS, we uh, could also reduce the background due to the uh, interaction of heavier nuclei, which are greater than two, uh, in fragmenting into helium. And we reduce this background to an eligible value uh, of the order of the per mil. In order to identify the isotopes, we uh, measure simultaneously, the, we need to measure simultaneously the charge, the rigidity, and the velocity of the particle. So for this measurement, the uh, critical detector, the, the, the key detector are the tracker, the time of flight, and the reach. The tracker system is made of uh, uh, nine silicon layers. For this analysis, we do use the uh, eight layers, the layer one and the uh, the inner tracker in order to maximize the acceptance since our measurement in NKZ is at low energy. And uh, the tracker is providing uh, a measurement of the rigidity, which is the momentum divided by the charge of the particle, with a resolution of uh, better than 10% at 20 gigavolt. And as you can see, the response of the detector is well reproduced by our simulation. For the measurement of the beta, we have two detectors, the time of flight and the reach. The time of flight is made of uh, two matrix of scintillating counters located one above and the other below the core of the detector, so the inner tracker and the magnet. And is providing a measurement of the beta of the particle with a resolution of 2% for uh, helium or uh, with beta around one. Uh, in the bottom of the AMS instrument is located the, the rich detector, which has a dual radiator configuration, uh, configuration at the center, uh, types of sodium fluoride, uh, which are surrounded by aerogel. The sodium fluoride has a refractive index of 1.33, which corresponds to a Cherenkov threshold around uh, 0 0.75 centisix, um, and uh, provide the measurement of the beta of the particle with a resolution of 2.5 per mil for uh, charge two and beta around one. Uh, the aerogel, a tiles has a refractive index of uh, 1.05, which corresponds to a beta threshold at 0.96, and uh, is providing a measurement of the beta with a very good resolution of the order of 0.7 per mil for charge 2 and beta 1 particle. And these uh, three measurements define the true range of. Uh, measurement and uh, final results uh, which are in, in energy partially overlapping. In order to correctly measure the flux of helium 4 in the galaxy, we have to take into account and to correct for the interaction inside our detector. As I discussed before, for what concern the interaction of uh, heavier nuclei fragmenting into helium, we do uh, take this uh, under control with our measurement of the charge on top of, of AMS with the layer one uh, charge identification, and we reduce this contamination, this, ba this background, to a negligible value. Uh, the contamination of the, uh, in the helium-3 sample due to the fragmentation of helium-4 into helium-3 instead is more complicated because, as you can see, there is no change in the, in the charge, so it's more complicated to be tagged, but is determined from the, we can determine it from the direct measurement in AMS of the um, helium-4 fragmenting into tritium. And this because uh, helium-3 and tritium production cross-section in the helium-4 interaction are expected to be similar and constant at high energy above 0.2 GeV over nucleo as is supported by the literature. So with AMS, we can measure the isotopic composition of the products of the charge changing interaction uh, of the helium with the AMS detector. Selecting uh, charge two in layer one and TRD and charge one in the inner tracker and looking to the mass distribution of the products of this, in, of this uh, interaction. And we could in this way validate our Monte Carlo simulation with the direct measurement of the, of the experiment. 
The associated systematic error to this um, correction is of the order of 1.5% for the helium-3 and 1% for the helium-4. In order to identify the, the isotopes, we do uh, use a procedure which is um, uh, using the uh, unfolding of the, of the uh, rigid distribution. We select a narrow velocity beam compared to the beta resolution, and then we unfold the momentum distribution within this uh, very narrow beta beam, and using the tracker resolution function, we get the helium-3 and helium-4 peaks that now are separated, and we can count uh, the events on top of AMS with already the correction uh, due to the energy loss and due to the acceptance uh, accounted. Um, and then we fall back the results and if we fit uh, to the data in an iterative uh, process. And uh, here I show you the results of uh, this analysis what we published last year. The flux of the helium-3 and the helium-4 and the ratio has been uh, measured with the very same precision instrument in an extended uh, period of time from May 2011 to November 2017 in 21 periods of four barter rotation each. And uh, you can see on the left the, the flux of the helium-4 in blue and helium-3 in red for five uh, selected uh, characteristic rigid beams. And as you can see, so for the isotopes, the uh, uh, flux is not time independent, but show structures and uh, the structure are nearly identical for helium-3 and helium-4. The, amp the relative amplitude of this structure is decreasing with increasing rigidity and uh, going from um, um, a factor two in the first rigidity beam to about 10% in the last uh, beams, which is shown. Uh, in the left plot, uh, I show the ratio of the helium-3 over helium-4 uh, as a function of time for the very same characteristic rigidity beams. And we observe that below um, 4 gigavolt, the uh, ratio has a, a transient in its behavior, so before uh, is stable and then start to decrease. And the, the timing of uh, the time of this transient uh, has been uh, uh, estimated to be around the end of February 2015, uh, which is uh, in a compatible with what we found in the uh, in proton over helium. And also the structure that you see on the left of the, or the variation, let's say, of the flux uh, as a function of time are uh, in agreement with uh, the same measurement that we perform in positron, electron, and proton. In this plot is shown the flux of the helium-3 and the helium-4 uh, uh, averaging time as a function of rigidity. And the error here are the total error uh, accounting for both a systematic and statistical. The helium-3 flux, uh, the helium-4 flux uh, has been measured in the, rigid, in the rigidity range between 2.1 and 21 gigavolt um, based on 100 million helium-4 events. The helium-3 has been, uh, flux has been measured in the range between 1.9 and 15 gigavolt based on 18 million events. And the shaded region show the range of the time variation. And we also measured the, the, the ratio between the helium-3 and the helium-4, again, mm, average in time as a function of the rigidity with total error. Uh, for rigidity below 4, uh, the shaded um, blue area um, indicates the um, results of the uh, single power law fit for each of the 21 um, time periods. Above 4 gigavolt, the green line indicates the fit with a single power law, and we measure the, the, spectral, uh, the spectral index to be um, uh, around the minus 0 0.2.94 plus or minus 0 0.004. The, the, the fraction of helium-3 and helium-4 steadily, steadily decreases as a function of rigidity. 
And uh, we also check the spectral index stability that seems to be constant, uh, that we observe to be constant above 4 gigavolt. And uh, um, to be in agreement with uh, the spectral index uh, that we measure in the boron over carbon and boron over oxygen at high energy. In order to compare our measurement uh, with the previous experiment, which were provided only in kinetic energy and not, never in rigidity, we repeated this analysis also as a function of uh, kinetic energy. And you can uh, appreciate the, the, uh, the measurement of AMS, which are extending the region uh, of uh, the, this measurement to much higher, uh, to higher uh, energy um, in a region which is almost, uh, was almost unexplored. And here you can see also the, the comparison with uh, the Galprop model. To conclude, uh, AMS has performed a precision measurement of the uh, cosmic ray helium-3 and helium-4 uh, isotope fluxes and, and their ratio with the rigidity from 1.9 to 15 gigavolt for helium-3, from 2.1 to 21 gigavolt for helium-4, and from 2.1 to 15 gigavolt for the ratio based on 100 million in 4 and uh, 18 million in 3 nuclei. Below 4 gigavolt, the in 3 to in 4 flux ratio show a long-term dependence. The in 3 to uh, in 4 flux ratio was found being always decreasing with rigidity below 4 gigavolt, following a power law with uh, a, a delta uh, equal to minus uh, 0 0.21 plus or minus 0 0.02 and the time dependence of plus or minus 0 0.05. Above 4 gigavolt, the helium-3 to helium-4 uh, helium flux ratio was found to be time independent and its rigid independence is well described by a power law with delta equal to minus 0 0.294 plus or minus 0 0.004. The measured helium-3 to helium-4 flux ratio power low spectral index is in agreement with the one that we measure at high rigidity for the boron over oxygen and boron over carbon ratio. Thank you for your um, attention. Yeah, thank you, Francesca, uh, and con congratulations on these nice uh, AMS results. Thank you. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. And please raise your hands or write something in the chat if you have a question for Francesca. Yeah, I see that uh, Monica. Yes. Also question. So I have a question. So the proton over helium also decreases. So the explanation is it's due to the isotopic composition of helium with what we saw today, or we cannot conclude that yet? No, it's not, con it's not connected to, we don't believe it's uh, connected to that. We believe that it's connected to a rigidity, a, let's say, um, to dependence due to the, to the different uh, charges for, so far, but we don't have conclusion. Okay, so because here you know, there is also this decrease in the flux ratio, it doesn't mean it explains the proton to helium. Uh, not so, we don't have conclusion so far, let's say. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions? I, uh, I had a, a more or less technical question. If, if you go back to slide five, you so on top of solar mo modulation, you also see modul some sort of modulated structure on smaller time scales, like half a year. Is uh, can you say something about that? Is this related to solar activity or? Yes, there are some connections with the um, with the solar activity that has been studied specifically in for the proton and helium, uh, and we do have also now the study for the daily to see if it uh, really. So we, we have uh, ongoing uh, work uh, which is also more detailed in time to to be associated to activity in the sun. Yeah, so it's really so there's some some physics behind that. Physics, right? Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other hands up. Okay, then uh, thank you, Francesca. Thanks to you. And um, let me see who's next. So 
We come to the pre uh, presentation by Jiahui Wai. Yes, hello. hello. Okay, I'll start sharing. Let's see. Um, yeah, can you see it properly? Yeah, I think some. Uh, we, we, see, we see the presenter screen. Ah, uh, okay, I see. So I will go back. Just see. Yeah, this is better. Yeah. Okay, great. We also see your cursor. Yeah. Uh, okay, so good morning or afternoon. I'm Jeff Wei from the University of Geneva. So today, on behalf of the AMS collaboration, I would like to present to you the ore measurements on the light nuclear isotopic composition in the cosmic waves using AMS. So as we have presented that in with MS02, we have, we have uh, uh, intensively measured primary and secondary nuclei fluxes, which has been covered by a talk on Tuesday. And this measurement of uh, nuclear nuclei fluxes has provided important information to understand the origin and the propagation of cosmic rays. And furthermore, we can get additional information from the isotopic composition of this nuclei. So for example, this, the, the isotopes may have different origins like in helium and um, proton neutron that one of the isotopes is secondary and the other one is mainly primary. So this topic has been covered by the previous talk on helium and you will hear another one in the following talk. And isotopes may also have different propagation history. A good example of this is beryllium, where beryllium-7 is an isotope with short lifetime, but beryllium-9 is a stable one, where beryllium-10 has a lifetime of around 1.4 million years. So that is uh, compatible to the, time, uh, to the uh, residence time of beryllium in the galaxy. So that makes beryllium isotope a so-called radioactive clock to study the propagation history of cosmic rays. Another interesting topic is about lithium isotopes, where the lithium-6 and 7 are supposed to be mainly primary uh, secondary cosmic rays, so that they are determined by the secondary produc production cross-section from carbon and oxygen. But this the measurements of these two isotopes may also be used to test the presence of primary lithium in cosmic rays. So this I will explain in more details for the following talks. And so for this presentation, I will focus on lithium and beryllium isotopes where we develop isotopic composition measurements with MS. So before I go to the measurements, let me have more remarks on the two nuclear isotopes. So for lithium, there are two recent cosmic ray propagation study which use the AMS, lithium, beryllium, and boron data to perform a global feat. So as you can see in these two publications, they found some tensions uh, in the lithium uh, fluxes where the data shows to be higher than what we expected from the model. So on the right, you can see example from one of those pa uh, these papers. Uh, so this, this dash and dot line is what expected from the model. And the red line is after considering the time period of AMS data taking to account for the solar modulation. And you will see a model expectation like this, where the points is the AMS published data. And you can clearly see the, the tension at this part. So that both of the two studies proposed different interpretations for this difference. So in one of them, it, this is interpreted as uncertainty in the lithium production cross-section. And in the second one, this is interpreted as a contribution from primary lithium. So if we add primary lithium to these models, so you will find another uh, red line here, which is compatible with AMS data. So that the measurements of lithium isotopic composition may help to further investigate this tension as the primary lithium is expected to be lithium-7. So the next page is on the beryllium isotopes. So as I presented, the beryllium-10 can be, can be used as a radioactive clock. So as you can find in these two recent studies, this illustrates how they, we can use the beryllium 10 to beryllium 
to borrow 10 decay to study the propagation models. So this is one of the example uh, from this paper that so the points is AMS data of the flux ratio of beryllium to boron. So in the model, if beryllium 10 is assumed to be stable, so you will get this dotted line, which is much higher than what we get from data. So if we take into account the decay of from beryllium to boron, you will see these several lines, which is, uh, is for different parameters. That is uh, for the genetic halo size, and so this increasing at this energy range can be explained that below a certain energy, below, uh, uh, below certain energy, the escape time of the beryllium will be uh, longer than the decay time. So you will see a constant increasing of the ratio of beryllium to boron. So with this method, you can uh, already constrain these parameters, but you but this method is limited by the cross section of uh, the splashing from beryllium to boron. So to further constrain the models, a more direct way is to use the beryllium ten to nine measurements. So with this uh, the unstable isotope to the stable isotope ratio, you can directly have a better understanding of the lifetime of cosmic rays in the galaxy. And with this information, this can further help to discriminate between different propagation models and further to constrain the parameters in their model. So with MS, we are able to extend this measurement of beryllium 10 to 9 to around 20 GB. So then I would go to the measurements of the isotopes. So with MS, for to identify the incoming lithium and uh, beryllium, we will use the charge measurements by the first layer of our tracker and the upper part of time of flight and the inner seven layers of tracker and the lower time of flight. With this uh, independent measurements, we can reach, achieve negligible charge confusion. So with this uh, lithium and beryllium data, we can then identify the mass depending on the rigidity, which is uh, defined as momentum divided by charge measured by the inner part of the treasure to have a lot of acceptance. And the beta measured by in different energy ranges, the time of light, uh, the rich so, uh, sodium fluoride and the rich aerogel, which covering different energy ranges. So from the rigidity and the beta resolution, we can calculate the estimated lithium mass resolution. So as you can see here, the mass resolution for both of the three uh, independent uh, measurements is around one atomic mass unit. So that means we cannot reach uh, event by event identification. Therefore, this isotopic abundance will came from the feet to the shape of the mass distribution. And here you can see it's the same situation for beryllium that the mass resolution is less than is larger than one MU. So to build this mass template for the feeds, uh, we reconstructed the mass from the beta resolution and the rigidity resolution models obtained from Monte Carlo simulation. And then we, the systematics in this mass template is implemented by varying the beta resolution and the rigidity resolution models with several nuisance parameters which account for the shifts, the width of the shape and the tails. So therefore we will build one template for each isotope in each energy beam for each analysis. Then to get the isotopic abundance, we perform the global transfer minimization with bin to bin correction introduced for the nuisance parameters. So here is a definition of uh, test square and here is a uh, how we perform the global feeds. So here in this, uh, in this formula, this C uh, accounts, uh, stands for the abundance of isotope A for in each in a certain energy beam. And this new is for the nuisance parameters in each energy beam. And uh, they describe the uncertainty of the shape of beta and rigidity resolution functions. And the covariance matrix is chosen to take into account the correlation between bin to bins. 
So after performing the global fits, we will obtain the abundance. So here are three examples. That is the lithium isotopic abundances uh, get for the three uh, independent beta measurements. And here the errors on the abundance has included both the systematic and the statistical error for the mass, uh, where the systematic error is for, from the mass template. And also we can apply the same method to get the beryllium mesotopic abundances. And, and we noted that for beryllium, a larger challenge is that the beryllium 10, which we are interested in is actually the least abundant one of the three isotopes. So with this uh, relative abundances, we can then calculate the isotopic fluxes for each isotope. So here is an example of lithium six and seven, where the flux is computed from the abundances and the effective acceptances and the exposure time introduced for by the geomagnetic field. And then we should correct it for the contamination from fragmentation of high value nuclei since lithium and beryllium is less abundant by the uh, than carbon and oxygen, and they can contribute a large amount of um, uh, fragmentation background. And then we afford the fluxes to correct for the energy migration due to the finite beta resolution. And on the right, you can see the lithium and fluxes in different energy ranges, where the three analysis both have some overlapping region for cross-check. So then we can uh, compare this measurements with previous experiment as you, as you can see here is uh, compatible with the previous measurements. And for the first time we measure the lithium and lithium isotopic fluxes about 0 0.3 GeV per nucleon. And from the uh, isotopic flux, we, send, we can then calculate the isotopic flux ratio from the feet. And again, in the three energy ranges, and then put it together and compare with the previous measurements. So here you can see the previous measurements is below one GeV per nucleon and we extend it about one GeV per nucleon to around 10 GeV per nucleon. And it's uh, consistent with the previous measurements in the low energy part. And similarly, this is the results for beryllium isotopic ratio. And we, again, we extended this measurements to uh, around 10 GeV per nucleon. Uh, but please uh, be noted that this result, we need further analysis on the background subtraction since beryllium is the least abundant isotope below charge eight. And then we also perform this uh, isotopic flux measurements as a function of rigidity. So to get these uh, measurements, we use different binning as a function of kinetic energy for the two isotopes to get the same rigidity binning. So we will perform the previous uh, introduced uh, analysis methods to get the fluxes for the two sets of binnings. And then we convert it from kinetic energy per nucleon to rigidity to get the flux for each isotope. So here the two isotopes are displayed where this lithium seven has been, has been multiplied by a factor of 0 0.5 to just to avoid overlapping with each other. And from the flux measurements, we can then get the isotopic ratio. And here is the result of lithium six to seven. And uh, we put also together with the AMS01 measurements. So we have consistent result. And for the first time we measure this flux ratio to around 20 GV. So in conclusion, the isotopic composition measurements of like nuclei in cosmic ray is a key measurements to understand cosmic ray origin and propagation. So here in AMS, we presented dedicated method based on template feet of the mass distribution. 
and the following preliminary AMS results have been presented. So we, pre we presented the first measurements of lithium-6 and 7 fluxes as a function of kinetic energy per nucleon above 0 0.3 GeV per nucleon and as a function of rigidity from 2 to 20 GeV. And we also presented the first measurements of lithium-6 to 7 ratio and 10 to, beryllium-10 to 9 ratio about 1 GeV per nucleon. So uh, in the future, we would like to further refine the measurements of lithium and beryllium, and we will probably extend these measurements uh, also for boron isotopes. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Joey. Yeah. So the floor is open for questions. So also here, congratulations on your new results and I'm looking Thank forward you. to your PL publication. Uh, I was actually wondering, uh, are you also, so you mentioned uh, the global fit, uh, which requires knowledge of this bin to bin correlation matrix. Is, is this information that AMS also is planning to, to share um, outside the collaboration in the future? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean, uh, share which part? You... So the uh, the bin by bin correlation matrix that yeah. you for the global fit, um, I, I think this is not published, is it? I mean, uh, no, this is not yet. Yeah, if I mean, you mentioned various studies that are uh, fitting secondary to primary ratios. Mm -hmm. I guess these uh, these studies from uh, external uh, collaborators. Yeah, these are from external collaborators. Yeah, so, so maybe this is this would be something to think about. Yeah. So I don't see any raised hands otherwise or questions in the chat. Okay, then uh, thank you, Jahui. Okay, thank you as well. And we come to the last presentation today by Francesco. Hi, Francesco. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh. Good afternoon. <laughs> yes, still morning. Okay, I will share my slides. Okay. Can okay. you see them? Yes, please, you can start. Okay. So good morning. So good uh, afternoon or good morning to everybody. So I'm Francesco Di Miccoli um, from uh, ENFN TIFP institution, and um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk uh, on behalf on behalf of IMS02 uh, collaboration to one particular uh, measurement uh, um, of IMS02 on the ESS, the one regarding neutrons and neutrons over photon ratio. So as introduced from my by my colleagues before, uh, from, MS, from uh, 2011 to 2018, MS provided many fundamental measurements in cosmic ray physics. And among all, this, all these studies in this talk, I would like to concentrate on the nuclei of secondary origin. So they were, they were already being introduced. So very fast, uh, they are produced from collision of uh, primary cosmic rays uh, coming directly from the acceleration sites with the interstellar medium. They carry information on the history of the uh, travel of the cosmic ray itself through the galaxy and the property of the ESM. And thus are fundamental for the understanding of the origin and propagation of cosmic rays. Uh, as I said before, the most abundant species in cosmic rays are lithium, uh, secondary species in cosmic rays are lithium, beryllium, and boron, as long as uh, secondary originated isotopes like uh, helium-3 and neutrons. In this slide, uh, I put uh, the status of the secondary cosmic rays measurements uh, um, before IMS in the top part. Uh, in the top part, for example, I put uh, the status for two nuclei, lithium and boron. It can uh, be seen the lack of high energy precision measurement uh, uh, in both the cases. For the case of the isotopes below, the only measurement is uh, in the extremely low energy range, below 1 uh, GV per nucleon. Otherwise, you see some uh, measurement with very high uh, uncertainty uh, for the neutrons uh, in uh, above 1 GV per nucleon. 
so has introduced uh, not only the chemical composition but also the isotopic composition of cosmic rays is affected by reaction on ESM. Um, typically, lighter isotopes like uh, helium-3 from helium-4 are produced from spallation of heavier one. The deuterium has a different behavior since uh, the reaction of proton-proton fusion is also important for its production. And uh, it is dominant below the GB per nucleon uh, of energy. Uh, in, def in definitive, uh, deuteron ratio like uh, deuteron over proton and deuteron over helium can provide uh, some orthogonal information with respect to the commonly used uh, tools like uh, boron over carbon ratio. Uh, so they, they test different energy ranges and uh, also different propagation distances. And these uh, combined effects are very important, very interesting, as I will uh, show next, for uh, indirect dark matter research. So, uh, annihilating particles of dark matter are expected to give rise to excesses in the antiparticle spectra. For example, some deviation in measured in the antiproton spectra, spectrum uh, are being interpreted in this way. But uh, to do so, it is uh, necessary a very deep knowledge uh, of the yield of antiproton production uh, from standard sources. Also because, uh, this is important also because the antiproton are the main source of background for the search of uh, heavy antinuclei, which are uh, far more promising uh, smoking guns of the presence of dark matter in the galactic halo, like for example anti-deuteron or anti-helium. So this is where isotopic analysis can uh, really shine, and in particular the deuterium one is very interesting because uh, uh, antiprotons come from much further with respect to both boron and carbon, which, is, uh, which are a test only for local propagation. So uh, light secondary nuclei like deuteron and uh, helium-3 can contain better the, basically the antiproton uh, secondary production. This analysis is being performed independently by the three other groups in IMS, so we have a good level of cross-check cross uh, uh, within our uh, collaboration. Very fast, uh, IMS was already presented, uh, so I will go, I will just uh, recall you that, that we need uh, three concurrent measurements of uh, rigidity, velocity, and charge to identify an isotope, the mass of an isotope. We use, uh, uh, so it's uh, very important to have a measurement, a good measurement of the rigidity that is given by the combination of, of what we call inner tracker, so the seven uh, tracker layers inside uh, our uh, magnetic volume, and the first external layer. And uh, for velocity, we have uh, two uh, detector, uh, two velocity measuring detector, the time of flight detector active at uh, very low energies, and a Cherenkov detector that we call rich, that is actually the combination of two different detector, uh, two different, uh, uh, yes, we can say two different detector, one based on sodium fluoride and one based on aerogel. Uh, um, we identify the, the Z equal to one charge with concurrent, uh, with uh, recurrent, sorry, uh, measurement um, uh, by all these uh, subdetectors. Okay, I show here some of the peculiarities of this particular me measurement, uh, the deuteron one, which is quite challenging. So, thanks to its subdetector, MS can perform the distinction in three different energy ranges, uh, which are uh, limited by velocity threshold, basically. A magnetic spectrometer like MS can better perform isotopic distinction uh, of particle of the same velocity. So the natural units for this measurement would be kinetic energy per nucleon, which is proportional to velocity. Um, the interesting physics effect, uh, to, uh, nevertheless, are mostly rigidity dependent, uh, like for example, SORA modulation. And so IMS02 is able to perform, the, the, is able to give the final result in this variable. But uh, deuterons and protons are the only isotope with very different rigidity at parity of beta because one is uh, uh, weights double with respect to the, the other. So calculating the ratio is uh, not straightforward since, uh, as if seen in rigidity, the different energy ranges become uh, quite interla interlaced with each other. So, moreover, the two isotopes have different mass, very different mass, so experience a completely different energy loss through MS. So for all this reason, this um, measurement is quite challenging. We try uh, for um, just a few words on the selections. Uh, we 
organize them in three steps. Uh, as I said, we use uh, layer one plus inner tracker, and uh, we choose not to use the last uh, layer of uh, uh, IMS tracker to exploit the acceptance and to have the maximum acceptance poss possible. And uh, then we define the Z equal to one sample uh, with uh, co uh, recurrent measurement of charge uh, along the path. And then we have uh, the most important step uh, that assure with selection aim to assure a good measurement of velocity. So a uh, set of selection uh, for the quality of the time of flight measurement and a multivariate analysis for reach, for the reach. Okay. Uh, this is necessary because in the case of uh, reach measurement, uh, uh, Z equal to one means very few sharing of photon sharing of photon to perform the measurement. And so uh, we can say a lot of noise. In the central panel of the slide, you can see a typical mass distribution obtained with sodium fluoride. And you can see that these, uh, the two peaks of protons and deuterons are overimposed on uh, uh, quite, a, quite a bit of noise. So to deal with this, we develop a completely data-driven multivariate technique to try to get rid of the noise, defining two regions in the mass spectrum one in which the signal is, is expected to be dominant, the green one, and one in which background is dominant. On these two samples, we train a multivariate uh, classifier based on the BDT technology, basically. And we, with a cut on this uh, classifier, we manage to get rid of uh, more than 95% of, uh, of this background. This is a, a sample of uh, the situation after this uh, selection. And you can see that we can uh, well distinguish uh, the, two, the two peaks, but uh, still the resolution, the mass resolution is not sufficient for uh, event by event identification. So what we do is to fit uh, the mass distribution to obtain the deuteron fraction. To, you, to do this fit, uh, since we have uh, basically a signal that is uh, two order of magnitude less than the, the, the background, we basically build the templates using Monte Carlo simulation. So the strategy is to fit the mass distribution with uh, the Monte templates from Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, we don't use them rigidly, but we allow some, gray, some uh, level of elasticity um, on those templates, uh, tuning the velocity response function with a smearing of uh, the time of flight uh, and uh, the ch measured check of angle. So in the left plot, you can see a collection of modified templates for protons in red and the deuterons in blue, obtained uh, changing the parameters of the tuning. Among all of, all of them, we choose uh, the one that gives the best mass fit in terms of uh, reduced chi-square. This allow us to optimize uh, the agreement between data and template, and also to extract uh, the systematics uh, uh, associated to this procedure. Okay. So, um, since IMS is operating since uh, 2011, we have a very big period of data taking uh, with uh, changing condition of solar modulation, which affect uh, the mass distribution. Uh, for this reason, we had to include in the simulation also this effect to be able to fit uh, the mass distribution both in period of solar maximum and solar uh, minimum. As you can see in the left panel, uh, including this effect, uh, we managed to have uh, templates which are uh, the um, dashed line that uh, are able to follow the shape of the uh, proton peak uh, even in uh, different uh, periods of time. So gathering all these, we can finally perform our fit, an example in the lower panel, or adding also the contribution given by the fragmentation of cosmic helium nuclei into the detector um, into secondary proton deuteron centrisium, that are the three uh, colored contribution here, which, are, were measure, which were independently measured with other data-driven techniques. So, Finally, moving to, uh, to my result, I show here uh, my results uh, about uh, deuteron flux and uh, my our result of deuteron flux and uh, deuteron over proton ratio. Regarding the deuteron flux, uh, we present the results uh, uh, multiplied by rigidity to the power 2.7 to exploit the dynamic of the, of the flux. And uh, the error bar here uh, includes uh, the statistical uh, error and uh, our evaluation of systematics of this measurement. On the top right panel, you can see a breakdown of these, uh, of these uh, error bars. And uh, in particular, two contribution, the statistical one 
uh, the red and the, and the acceptance one have a, a, uh, show a sudden uh, increase uh, entering the rich, so the sodium fluoride energy region. This is because, uh, both because uh, of um, the reduced statistics, the reduced efficiency of this detector that uh, uh, makes more difficult the measurement and also the uh, higher number of selections that are necessary and these increase our systematic uncertainty on the acceptance of the detector. As you can see, our uh, measurement spans uh, from uh, 1.2 up to 19 uh, GB of rigidity, which is uh, more than one order of magnitude, more than, uh, than uh, the, our predecessor. Last thing is that uh, thanks to the very high acceptance of the IMS, we can uh, try to do this analysis in a dependence of time. So in uh, using a reduced time binning of uh, four months each, we can plot the deuteron and uh, the comparison between the deuteron and the proton flux uh, in particularly interesting uh, rigidity beams. As you can see from the insert on the top, uh, IMS02 is able to span uh, the, completely, the complete 24 solar cycles, so with two so periods of solar minimum and one period of solar maximum. Uh, we are starting to analyze this data and we are starting to have some uh, small statistical evidence of uh, time behavior of the deuteron over time uh, dependence of the deuteron over proton ratio. These uh, results are very preliminary, but we are starting to see some kind of break breakout of the behavior uh, in a time which is uh, correlated with polar flip on the sol of the solar magnetic field. So in conclusion, um, isotopic composition of light nuclei, as I said before, is a key measurement uh, for cosmic ray physics. We are able to give the first precision measurement of deuteron flux uh, above uh, we, uh, one uh, GV per nucleon, and uh, we are able to give for the first time a measurement in rigidity for one to 20, from 1 to 20 GV, and we are having the first hints of en low energy time dependence of this uh, ratio, uh, which is uh, uh, still to be understood. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Francesco. So are there uh, questions for Francesco? Please raise your hand if you have any. OK. But, uh, doesn't seem to be the case. Everything was clear, Francesco. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. OK. And um, so this brings us uh, to the end of this session. We, we also had uh, a scheduled um, a dedicated discussion uh, session after a short break. But since we are very early, I suggest that we can uh, start this uh, general discussion session um, right now. So if you have uh, anything that you want to to bring up right now, you can you can do this here in forum. You can also start discussions, of course, uh, in the MetaMost chat. But I guess everyone is exhausted by now and wants to have some kind of food lunch or dinner or late night snack. Okay, if, if this is not the case, um, then we can uh, stop for now. Uh, I will stay on um, uh, the, the Zoom call and also the, um, the technical support. Uh, Jiri is, go is going to leave the Zoom call open. Uh, if you want to have some uh, discussions also later. And uh, again, I thank you all for your participation and um, talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>